check. Check one. Sibilance. Sibilance. Um, I think you'll like my fun fact today, too. Oh, nice. Have you looked at it yet? Nope. Oh. I didn't look at your... Uh, um, your you uh, look at my answers either? No. Okay, good. I didn't. I mean, I took good. what you, you know, you inspired the, the me. challenge from, that right, I said. Right. So going right to the limit. So I took that in mind, but I didn't look at any of your actual mm-hmm. list. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah. we got that there. Sounds good. All right. Uh, yeah. Ready to I'm go? raring to okay. go. Okay, I am. Whatever that means. Ready to go. I want to roll the sleeves up, but they're so tight. Yeah. You know? Can you be raring to do anything else other than go? Raring to go. I'm raring to stop. Mm. I've never Has anybody any been raring context. to stop? I don't know. Probably. Yeah. I, people can be ready to stop, but I've never heard anybody say raring. raring to do anything but go. I've never heard it outside of that context. So, yeah. Not to say you couldn't. Maybe you could start a trend. I don't want to. You don't. You don't. No, want I don't to? like raring. I'm raring. Too to many con- R's. Raring. I'm raring to continue. All right, let's do it. How about it. that? All right. All right. Here we go. Welcome everybody to episode number one hundred and twenty-three. One, two, three of the Goulet Pencast, where fountain pens are still a thing. I am Brian Goulet. I am Drew Brown. And we're here from Goulet Pens to deliver this casual and informal, tangential and extraneous, superfluous and extemporaneous fountain pen show where we talk about what's going on at the Goulet Pen Company and in our fountain pen lives. In today's show, we're going to be talking about how we would spend $100 at Goulet Pens if we were starting from scratch, how to deal with loved ones who just don't get our fountain pen obsessions, our top three most innovative pens that we have on our site, what inks that we'd recommend for grading papers from a high school teacher's perspective, uh, why there aren't any glass-bodied pens, and we have a meet the team with Brian Kay from our customer care team. So you will enjoy him. The other Brian, a.k.a. the Brian that you'll actually get to talk to if you call up and ask to talk to Brian. The the Brian that has (laughs) disturbingly similar hobbies and interests. He has very good taste, I must say. It felt... (laughs) Not unfamiliar. <laughs> Good. Having him here. Well, y'all will get to see him in a more extended fashion if you haven't interacted with him already. Um, and we'll go ahead and kick off the episode with some feedback. All right. We're going to start things off with some feedback from M. So M writes, hi, guys. Tonight, I had to drive on an unfamiliar, winding, unlit road at night hmm. in the driving rain. It was scary and stressful, but I had you guys, Pencast 119, with me the whole way through, and it gave me courage. Thank you for the long show. I needed all two hours and 17 minutes. Love the cast. It's the highlight of my week. I completely understand, and and the fact that we were able to be there for you is immensely appreciative on our part. Mm -hmm. I, too, find peace in stressful driving situations coupled with something auditory i don't like just the Mm. silence i feel like that stresses me out more i see that because i i just i focus more on like you need to be focused while you're driving in dangerous conditions sure sure. yeah but i feel like i'm almost overly focused Mm. or almost too tense Mm. and that can be bad too like i feel more comfortable and more Mm. i guess willing to adapt when i'm one step below frantic Okay. And then yeah. podcasts and music help, helps me with that. So. Yeah, I'm on board. Yeah. I'm on so. board with that. I listen to podcasts and stuff all the time. Yeah. All the time. Like sometimes I'll turn it off if the rain is so loud I can't hear it. Um, but if I'm actually stressed, I'm like, no, let me let me hear something to kind of like put mm. me at ease a little bit and help my mind process things Yeah. in a normal, a more natural state. Yeah. That's so. cool. I'm glad we can be a part of that. Definitely. Very cool. All right. Uh, Mama Tomasu. Mm. says, I'm loving Drew's tips on ice pops. I'm 39 with three kids. Hey, 39 with one kid. Um, And never thought about intentionally freezing them upright to avoid sticky scissors. Heck yeah. Also, great tip tip to cut off tops in a rounded fashion to avoid the stabby corners. So simple. Hashtag, I am today years old when I learned this. Happy happy to help. Life life hacks. That is what we are here for. Yeah. Not really, but kind of. These yeah. little tidbits that you pick up. If yeah. you say, well, sit down and say enough words, some of them are going to get in the if right If you have one you know, takeaway from this, then we're winning. <laughs> and then finally, It's Me Lori says, I wonder if Brandon orchestrated an elaborate prank on Drew regarding cold or cold Doritos. But I may just try it to see, LOL. Uh, yeah, no one, Brian, in the comments said, yes, cold Doritos are a thing. 
So maybe it's really not a thing. BK, Brandon, and Ethan all being like, oh yeah, cold Doritos. I don't know if they They just had a meeting and we're like, let's make Drew think that cold Doritos. I are don't a thing. know, but it's just <laughs> them. It is just them. Maybe it's a regional thing. I don't know. Mm, I don't think so. Like regional to, regional to this building, to this, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So thank thank you all for validating me and you okay. know, I'm not alone there. They, it right. is a weird thing that makes no sense. Okay. Well there you go. Did BK bring that up in his interview? Probably not. No, this is before then. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I should have. Also, he put a pilot varsity, sorry, pilot vanishing point nib on a Twisby Go today. Oh. So I, that's fun. I, I don't, I don't mention that in he the. He can Frank, he he can Franken pen the heck out of yeah. some pens. I don't mention that in the interview, but he did that today. Wow. It was frightening. Maybe that's what Ethan wanted to show me this morning. I came in, I was late for a meeting. He was like, let me show you this. And I was like, I got to run. And he was like, never mind. It's not that important. I bet that's what it was. It's scary. <laughs> it's very scary. <laughs> oh, that's fun. Okay. I got one from Jeffrey Hall. It says, hi, guys. Really enjoying the segments where we get to meet one of your team. Hey, look at that. Of course, your pencasts are always fun. Can't wait to see what Brian's bridge looks like when it's done. <gasps> it is done. More on that later. Mm. I went hard on it the last couple of weeks. Um, Mac says, once uh, you've once again activated my chemistry student side. Ha ha. Bismuth is my favorite element. Bismuth crystals are absolutely stunning. I feel like I've heard of this. You, t- you talked about it. <laughs> yep, sure did. This is in response to Bismuth. our yeah. conversation. You are talking okay. about how cool it was. Yep, yes. Yes, I did, <laughs> didn't I? How about that? <laughs> wow. Uh, it's not steel. Steel is specifically an alloy of iron and carbon. Because I was saying, can metal crystallize? And we were like, is bismuth a metal? I don't know. Oh, okay. And well, of course, we had several people in the comments beating their head up against the wall and people who are way smarter than us. And there you go. In that regard. And now that I'm reading the handle, it's also probably MSC, not M- MMAC. Yeah, M- I wasn't going to M- say anything. It's all good. Not on my game today, apparently. I don't even remember what I said last time. Uh, metal describes a certain section of elements of the periodic table that have certain characteristics, which iron, gold, silver, copper, but also bismuth and many more elements belong to. Oh, this keeps going. Okay. Bismuth bismuth, <clears throat> bismuth crystals are not really formed by a chemical reaction, but by melting the metal and then cooling it down slowly. There's a bunch of YouTube videos showing you how you can DIY one. I did... I was kind of Googling that as you, we were answering that question last week. Um, the amazing square spirally step structures, structures that the crystals have has to do with the way the bismuth molecules stack onto each other when the molten metal is cooled down. The beautiful iridescence the crystals have is a result of a chemical reaction. The surface of the bismuth oxidizes when exposed to air, and those oxides on the surface cause the beautiful oil spill colors. How about that? A crystal just refers to a solid that has a highly ordered microscopic structure. For example, the particles, atoms, molecules are stacked onto each other very orderly. So metals can be or form crystals, but not all crystals are metals, obviously. Right. So there you go. That's something new. That is fascinating. Yeah, that would have been... Nice to know that when we were talking about it last but week. But now we do. We're all in this together. <laughs> That's right. We're all learning, whether right. it's about chili pops or bismuth crystal. I just love that you, all of y'all are like have more knowledge of the things that we talk about, and then we can learn well, from you all. Well, we all have our strengths. We I think do. That I think of us as a collective community of mm. infinite intelligence. There you go. On any random subject. We're all part of the human organism, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. It's collective intelligence that we all have. Okay, um, so that's it for feedback right now, but we are going to try something different this week. We're going to try doing the company updates now instead of at the end because I can imagine probably not a lot of people are listening at the end, and sometimes we don't have as much. When we really started out to do the company updates, it was like, oh, we're going to talk about all the goings on inside, and then it's like, oh, there's actually, it's kind of hard to explain and give context, and some things are confidential, and okay, so it's kind of an afterthought for me sometimes, but we'll put it at the front and then see if that you know, fits. But anyway, let us know what you think. Yeah. Here are some company updates. All right. Pilot Metro overrated video, Drew. You got that out last week. Yeah. And honestly, it's Is not- Is it overrated? It's not called overrated anymore. We changed the we title- We changed that. Because it didn't, it didn't seem like it was helping at all. So now no, it's just it's like comparing- the essence. It, that, that is, I'm, the essence is, is the pilot- Metropolitan overrated, so I compare it to the Kakuno yeah. and the Spoiler Explorer. Spoiler alert, Drew thinks it's overrated. Well, I'll say this. I started the video 
thinking it was overrated. Uh -huh. You'll have to watch the video to find out whether or not that mm, opinion did stayed. Did he convince himself otherwise? Great question. Okay. Um, and then I got a video out earlier this week showing the Lamy Safari 2024 Special Editions. So if you happen to have not looked at YouTube in the last couple of days, then you may not have seen that yet. But I highly recommend you go check it out because they are kind of interesting. So we'll talk about those here in the new stuff in just a second. Um, we'll let you know we're not gonna have a pencast next week, um, but we are gonna be back the week after that. So we'll take another break, but then we'll be back. And then uh, right now, just some behind the scenes stuff. This is our time where we do our annual development reviews here at Goulet Pens, which is a very busy time. Not so stressful at all. Ryan is putting in some hours right now, but it's all right, we care for our team. It's an important part of the process. We do 360s, we do selfie evals, we do full-on development reviews, all that stuff. So it's it's pretty involved, especially for a company our size, but it's very intentional and it's an important part of what we do here. So that is all happening right now. So for the next couple of weeks, I'll be pretty busy. Um, and then earlier this week, um, we had the start of Lent and we had Fat Tuesday, which is, we've done that a number of years here now. Yeah, we do like a Fat Tuesday brunch thing with the king cake and all that stuff. favorite part of the year. Like we do a lot of fun so activities here. We do mac and cheese cook-offs, chili cook-offs. Mm -hmm. You know, we do Thanksgiving lunches. The Fat Tuesday brunch is my favorite part of the year. It's so good. There's pancakes, there's sausage and gravy, there's bacon. Bacon and oh my God, there was hash grits browns, this year, cheesy, hash brown casserole. Hash brown casserole. Oh my God. Mm. And there was whipped cream for the pancakes too, which I took advantage of. Yeah. Oh my God. I didn't eat lunch. I ate here's, so much for brunch. I just here's the thing lunch. about breakfast food, Brian. Mm. When you have a full assortment of breakfast food, uh -huh. when you've got pancakes and a meat, sausage, bacon, whatever, yeah. and you've got grits and you've got hash brown like that is not that assortment is not just a casual weekday assortment of foods. Mm. That that occurs in your life when you do not have to rush somewhere, mm. usually on the weekend or on a day off. Mm -hmm. It represents a lack of stress, a lack of daily commitment, a lack, a, a total freedom of your day. It says this, this mm. is a day where things are going to be chill because that that is usually where breakfast like that occurs, that sort of day. Okay. So it occupies a space in your brain that is free from stress, minimal mm. obligation, and just relaxation, chill, happiness, living in the moment. That's why breakfast food is magical. I'm all for breakfast food. Mm. And I will eat breakfast food any time of day. Oh, it's just the best. Like Brenner, that is a thing in the Goulet household. It's going to be. We eat it on the regular. Yeah. It's going to be this week for us, too. For sure. For sure. It's phenomenal. <sighs> Excuse me. Yeah. So we're, if we're, if we're, a little a dragging a little bit. It's because we have like four pounds of pancakes in our elated right is now. the word I will yeah. describe for myself. But yeah, cool. All right, so that's the company updates, and then uh, let's talk about some new stuff because we have a lot of it. All right, so biggest new thing that we have this week is the Lamy Safari Special Editions. So they kind of mixed it up last year. They switched it around. They did the All Star in February, and then the Safaris in April. Normally, though. They do the safaris in February and the all-stars in April. That's what they're doing again this year, I believe. Um, at least they are with the safaris. So um, we have two pens. We have Pink Cliff and Violet Blackberry. And they mixed it up this year. They did a two-tone color pop thing. First and time ever. We got all kinds of feedback on it. I was looking at the YouTube comments after we published the video and some people are like, this is the most amazing thing. I can't believe it. I'm gonna buy one immediately. And other people were like, this is an absolute travesty. How could they possibly do this? It's pretty entertaining to watch. Most people are pretty reasonable in the comments, but everybody feels something about it. I'll say that much. I mean, after the last two <laughs> years, there were some similarities between the safaris. Um, yeah, well, I mean- With like the candies kind of and the pasteliness. I, I, I think this is a departure and I appreciate that. It is, it is. You know, and it's like, I'm, I always have to remain pretty open-minded with the safaris, I feel like, you know? Cause it's like, they've come out with so many different colors. Mm -hmm. And as a accidental avid Lamy collector like I am, you know, they come out with something, I'm like, oh, you know, it's kind of similar to some other ones that they have. And so like, even if the color specific combination to me is not like, oh, this is everything I want in life. I'm like, I can appreciate that they're taking a swing and they're doing something different. So, that's like, my opinion. That's kind of where I stand on these ones, but I, fully understand is not gonna be for everybody. But the ink should be for everybody because ink is pretty phenomenal. Wait, these so. come with ink? Yeah, they do. It's been years since they did that, Brian. 
I know. I think the last paired ink that they did was Mango in 2020. For so one they, of the candy they had three, inks. Yeah, yeah. And just like. Or not candy. The Maybe it was. Yeah, they were called the candy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because the, then there was the yeah. D-Lights and then there yeah, was the. Yeah, the D-Lights the was the. The, um, that was last year. Pastel ones. Yeah, but then there were yeah. other pastel ones too. There was a green, a pink, and a blue. Those were the D-Lights, I think. Those, and then oh. there was strawberry and cream. Well, that wasn't was it, but, called anything. But then though. there was the, the purple and orange. The purple, the orange, and the like aqua one. Those were those were the candies. Okay, I don't know. But they, when it, so when they've come out with like groups like this, they'll call it like candy. And like this one's even called Kiwi, like K-E-W-I. But we're like not very clear on like what that is or what that means so like we didn't like blast that everywhere but anyway this technically is the kiwi collection um if i understand more what that means i'll let you know but as i, I don't as of this point but anyway pink cliff violet blackberry very cool looking pens we'll have images here that you can look at um but i don't know i'm i'm, I'm digging them i'm digging them and the ink the inks are great. I do sort of like mini ink reviews in the middle of this video. So if you, even if you don't like the pens, you should watch the video just to see what I do with the inks, like in the middle of the video somewhere. Um, and they are gonna have cartridges as well. The cartridges I think got delayed though. So we don't have the cartridges this week. Um, I think they're gonna be a couple of weeks away, but we will have them at some point. And I don't know how, I don't know like the stock of the ink or anything like that. I imagine it's something that like, if it's really popular, it might sell out you know, and then get restocked. So I could see like a stutter stepping on the availability of the ink um, since it's been kind of a while since they've had, you know, a limited ink like this. Um, okay, moving on to the other things. Um, Delta has a new uh, pen. This is kind of like a callback pen. So the DV original, um, this is the oversized pen. So this is the big the big honker, the big, oh, yeah. the big chonker as we're calling it it's a thick internally. Um, it is basically identical to Delta's Dolce Vita oversize from the days of yore. And um, the thing that's really different about it though is the nib. So the nib is used to be Bach on the old version and it is now Yovo. And we never carried the old version cause like we carried Delta, but we, you know, Delta started to kind of go, you know, by the wayside as we were still kind of like building up to it. So yeah. we never we never stocked the big one regularly. We were picking up kind of their new pens. Yeah. And not really digging so much into the we had like catalog. The, we had like the the masterpiece and we had like a couple versions of Dolce Vita, but we didn't have the we didn't have the big one. Yeah. Um and the like the mini and the slim and stuff like that. So the more obscure sizes. We carry the more popular stuff. But anyway, um you should definitely check it out though because the nib right's great. Um I'm familiar with the nib because we they just did the um uh, the red and the blue one, the limited edition ones that I'm failing to remember the names of them, but it's the same nib. It's a number eight size Yovo nib, which we really don't have a lot of those. I don't gold. Yeah. Too. Gold. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Gold. Um, pretty phenomenal writing nibs and, um, $676 for the pen. So it's, you know, it's an investment, but it's definitely like up in that kind of grail pen type of territory. Yeah. Um, and the thing that has, has historically always been, you know, kind of revered with these Delta pens is that it is a very large pen, but it's not super heavy. So um, it's actually more popular than you might think, even with people that don't have the biggest of hands, because you don't have to have like super strong hands to be able to write with it. Um, you know, it's just really fat. So actually it's really good for, you know, extended writing sessions because, you know, it's almost like, you know, not, not meaning this in a demeaning way. It's almost like a therapy pen that's yeah. like really big. And so it's just, it's it's rather comfortable for, for a lot of folks. So um, that one's worth checking out. So, and I believe this is just going to be a regular offered edition thing. So this is just, you know, Delta's coming back and they're bringing back their old stuff. I mean, you would, you honestly would probably never know that they even skipped the beat because like we compared the old one to the new one. And other than the nib, they're pretty much identical. No, so it's like they got pretty cool. frozen in time and thought out. Yeah, a little bit, a little bit. Um, like Austin Powers. I was thinking Captain America, but okay. <laughs> there you go. Um, applicable to both. Uh, and the last one I have, we have some new nibs for the Black Pilot Custom 743. So that's the number 15 size Pilot nib, same size as what's on the Custom 823. Um, but it's just on the black version of the 743. So there are now 14 different nib options on this pen. So if you're familiar with the Pilot Custom 912, that has the slightly smaller Pilot number 10 nib, uh, but that has 
15 nibs available on it. So there's one that's missing the music. Uh, so that's the only one that you won't have available on the 743. Uh, but everything else, soft fine, fine medium, soft fine medium, soft medium, coarse, posting, waverly, and stub. Those are all being added to the six nibs that we already had. Uh, I am in the process of nib nooking all of them actively. Uh, I don't expect to be crazy surprised with how they perform because I expect they're going to perform similarly to the custom 912s, just the nib will be slightly larger. Um, but I will say I have written with the soft fine one and gosh, it's such a pleasure. Pilot's nibs are just, mm, do you just own, a joy. Do you own a 743? Oh yeah. Oh, I, got yeah. A, I got a few of them. Oh okay. yeah. Yeah. I got a, I got the one of the vertigree with the um, Falcon nib. Um, which I originally didn't choose the Falcon nib on that one. And then I changed my mind. I just had to. That was smart. I couldn't not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I have uh, at least one other. I think I have a black one that's got a fine medium. I don't remember what nib I have on that one. I'll have to check that out. Um, but yeah, these are some cool nibs. So we'll definitely have to talk about these more because you're like, what the heck is a posting and a Waverly and a course and all that. And we want to tell you. We do. But we want to tell you. It's a lot in a of, good way. It's a lot of nibs to yeah. go over, so we'll yeah. we'll we'll figure out how to do that. Um, so yeah, pretty cool. But definitely go check those out. They're three hundred thirty six dollars a piece for those, and that is all I have to say. Drew, what have you got? Well, since we skipped a week, Brian, we kind of missed a whole week and then some of a lot of releases. So we did. my recommendation to you is to if you do want an overview of those, go back to next week's video on my what's new. Um, video for the week of February 5th, but I will run down real quick on some of the things I cover. So yeah. if you are interested in anything I'm saying here, go check out that video. So we got three new Ferris wheel press inks, Knitted Nettle, Sherry Sonata, and their 2024 special edition ink, Aurorealis, which is a really cool, crazy ink. So those are all featured there. Check those out. Two new Monteverde Ritmas, a full-size green one for $40, and then a smaller pocket size Ritma for 36 That pocket size Ritma, called the Gala, only available in black, comes with a lanyard. So you can wear that thing if you want, and you can pull it off if you don't want to. So very interesting there. Mm -hmm. um, a few other Monteverdes, we've got the Monteverde Invincia Vega, which comes in blue, green, purple, and yellow. Splatteries against black, looks very cool, 76 bucks on that one. The Monteverde Regatta come, came out with a Mondrian, so it is uh, in reference to the art by, you know, the aforementioned artist, and it is a wrap, so none of the segments that the, the Regatta normally has is one contiguous wrap. It looks very cool. Check that out. That's 108 bucks, And then two Conklin pens, the Lex and the Hippocrates, which are created um, in the, uh, you know, to target both legal professionals and medical professionals. We're carrying both of these in the rollerball and fountain pen format. So if you have anybody graduating from one of those two schools, keep that in mind. They're a great gift pen. And Schaefer is back. So Schaefer is a what? very, very well-known brand. We well, carried them a long time ago. Well, they, it, they never went away. They, yeah. They went um, away from us. <laughs> they're back home here with us. Yeah. So we carried them once upon a time, took a break. They're back. They're with a new distributor now. So we are happy to bring them back into the fold. We're starting light with the shape with a few Schaefer 100s, a few Schaefer 300s, and then a couple of Schaefer icons. Currently, they are sold out though. They actually were received really, really well. We are going to get more of those in stock. We'll probably open up our offering here pretty soon, just based on the fact that y'all seem to be interested. But uh, we'll see how round two does first. But uh, if you want any Schaefer pens, get on the wait list. We'll email you as soon as they return back with us. They also have converters and cartridges available. Mm -hmm. Edison Beaumont. We've got a new Beaumont, which is a nice smaller Edison pen. has a nice deep post. I love it. It's called River's Edge, which is a beautiful name for a beautiful, very similarly themed. If you've got River's Edge in your head and you see this pen, you're going to be like, oh, that makes sense. Looks like River's Edge. That's $149 made in the USA by Edison Pen Company. They're great. We've got a Benu Euphoria fountain pen. Loves Little Lark. If you want to celebrate Valentine's Day, this is the pen to do it with. It is hand-painted, so it's a little bit more expensive at $280. Available now. Montegrappa <laughs> Elmo 01, another exclusive Montegrappa to go along with the beach pen that we have had previously. We still have it, though. Less of a beachy vibe, more of just a coastal vibe. We're calling this one Barrier Reef. It is available for $316. It has a Yovo steel nib, iridium plated, though. So Sorry. Rhodium plated though, so it does have that nice pop of shine. It is, um, it has a resin made by the Turnt Pen Company, made exclusively for Montegrappa. That is all. Check those out if any of those things seemed interesting to you. I have a video where I go more in depth on them. Boom. Wow. Well done. That was a lot. That was a lot. 
Cool. All right. So definitely check out all the things we talked about here. We have new new arrivals coming soon stuff on our website. And uh, now we will roll into our Q and A. All right, Brian, I'm very excited about this question. Are from, you now? From Lord Wattle Bottle. Lord Water Bottle. Lord Water Bottle. That's Lord a good Water Bottle. It's a good bottle. Uh, good the, handle. The, 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 <laughs> the kind Lord Water Bottle says, mm -hmm. I would absolutely love a pen cast deep dive about mm. how Brian and Drew would each spend around $100 on the Goulet store if they were having to start from scratch today. Mm. So that is a very interesting challenge by... Lord Water Bottle, mm -hmm. and you told me that you were very proud of yourself and that you you uh, accomplished something great. You did say you went right up to the limit, and I was like, ooh. I did. You know what? I'm going to try to do that, too, because you said mm -hmm. if, if you go up to 99, I mean, we get free shipping. How would I maximize? So you took you that know? very seriously. So I was thinking about it, yeah. While I was tempted to look at your choices, I did not, but I did... Say, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna try to I'm get to that. Curious how this works out. I reworked mine a few times. Okay. Because I was, you know, part of it was like the price limitation thing. Like it was very real. Yeah. And I had to think like, okay, what's a good mix of things that I yeah. can get some different experiences? But you know, I had to think about like, oh well, you know, I was like starting from scratch. Yeah, starting from scratch. Now this is starting from scratch, like with physical objects, not like knowledge, right? right. So like I, knowing everything I know, mm -hmm. how would I start now? Obviously, you know. So you go ahead and um, okay. I have not seen your list. I'm really curious to. Okay, it's right here. I'm not going to look do at it, it though. Yeah. Okay. I'm curious how much we are going to overlap. Let's find out. Maybe not a lot. I I, I don't think we will. Probably not. I yeah. think we take different approaches to things, but that's okay. Um, first thing I started out with was a Pilot Varsity in blue. It's got a medium nib on it. That's all you get. I thought about the Varsity. Yep. It's three dollars and fifty cents. What I also like about the Varsity is it is refillable. You don't have to get a converter. You don't have to get O-rings or silicone grease or anything That's like that. That's a smart move. All you need is, you know, a, a rubber grip and some pliers, which, you, you know, that we're not counting in the budget here. You probably have that laying so around. So you're buying it with the intention of refilling it? Uh, with the option to refill oh, okay. it because I've seen my video and I'm educated <laughs> on how to do it now. Um, so, yeah, I would totally do But, I mean, even still, it's like... That's a good just disposable pen to have Absolutely. around. You know, you can just throw it in your bag and not have to worry about it. So that was kind of my like, okay, it's a medium nib, kind of all around, decent introduction. Um, and it's not a big investment, but I can reuse it if I want to. Next one I went, this was my, probably my splurge of the whole thing was a Twisby Eco. Okay. That's your splurge. That's my splurge. Oh my. I, I maximized my situation here. I got multiple pens, inks, and paper in this situation. All right. So I went with the Tuesby Eco Transparent Blue because blue. Classic. Um, with a broad nib. I debated about this one. I That's could more go, of our... The fine is probably a more universal nib. So that, you know, is probably what I would recommend to more people. But I do love the Twisby broad you nib. You know, that, that means Rachel's going to steal it more often though. Well, that's okay. She has her own budget and is going to buy her own nice. pens. How about that? Um, now, if you're talking like spousal interest as well, well, now you've got like twice as much to work with. Then we'd have to might have to move some things around. But no, this is just my own situation. If it was spousal interest, I would just buy hundred dollars of varsities for Shannon. There you go. <laughs> right. That's, that's exactly. all. She, that's all she tolerates. Exactly. Um, so yeah, uh, thirty-two ninety-nine for the, the ego. Okay. So that brings me up to $36.49. I got a running tally going on. Nice. I hope my math all works out. Um, next one I went for was a Diplomat Magnum, extra fine. So this is my fine nib, finer nib option, but I also chose that because that nib is a little springy. That's right. Surprisingly for a steel nib, and you can get a little bit of line variation. So that was a little bit of my, if I want to, I can test the waters hmm. with getting some line variation, especially the extra fine. You know, it doesn't have a ton of line variation, but you can get enough to get a taste for it. That was my that was my thought process there. That surprises me because the Diplomat Magnum being narrow and lightweight does not seem like a Brian pen. It's not, nor knowing what I know, extra fine nibs are not my go-to choice. Yeah. So this one is more of a, you know, if I'm writing a letter to somebody and I want it to look kind of fancy, mm -hmm. I'm not writing with it because I find it the most pleasurable thing to write with. I'm I writing see. with it as a tool to like produce the line on the page. And also just to get a sense of, you know, what that fine nib and what that, that variation is kind of like. We need to talk to Diplomat about making like a tungsten magnum so that you can actually use it. We need a magnum oversize. Yeah. 
Yeah, um, which is funny because it's called the Magnum, but it's right, actually it's tiny. a pretty thin pen. Uh, but part of the reason why I also chose that is because we have a deal right now where you can get a free bottle oh. of Monteverde Blue Skies. Oh, okay. I was hacking the mainframe a little I bit see. on this one. I see. It's well a great, done. it's like literally like a Goulet Blue ink. So I was like, boom, ink and pen wrapped together in one situation. So yes, I'm very proud of that one. Um, and then, so those are my pens, right? So that brings the tally up to $62.89. So three pens. Three pens. Not bad. Not crazy, but you know, enough. It's got a nib variety. I got some different options going on. Um, essentially kind of eyedropper fill, piston, cartridge converter, you know, a nice little light slow variety here. Um, then I went with some, some ink and I went with um, Diamine 30 mil because it's $8. And 30 mil is a pretty decent volume of ink. Um, those those little bottles are pretty durable. Uh, I actually will just throw one of those in my backpack while I'm traveling because it's under an ounce. You don't have to worry about in a carry-on luggage or anything. Uh, you don't have to worry about the bottle breaking. They are a little narrow. I was so about not to say, I pens. think your Magnum should be okay in there. Magnum I don't know about your Eco. The Eco, I think, would pretty much be fine. But I can, I'm can. i not afraid to do the bottle tilt and do the whole thing. Like I'm, I'll, I'll do that. I don't think I would really have a problem. So the eco will, it'll be fine. Okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I went with uh, Dimine Red Dragon. I love that ink. It's, you know, having a good, re nice red, mm -hmm. I don't know. It just seems like a good one. So there's a lot of good reds. There's, you know, those are good choices, but Red Dragon's like kind of my go-to. Um, next, and so that brings the total up to $70.89. Uh, and then I chose one more ink. Again, because of price limitations, I, I kind of kept it to, to the Dimine 30 mil here. So I went with Dimine Marine because I love that ink. It's a heavy shader. You know, I've got a blue, a red, and a turquoise there. I think that's our one overlap. Really? You, I, you did I, marine? I, I picked a sample, but yeah. Okay, okay. I did, I did it's go. It's a great, it's, it's a great It's so good. Color. And it's, you know, like even the Red Dragon, like it's red, but like you can pretty much use that on. It's a beautiful red. Anything. It's not, it's not a angry red. No. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so, like you know, you got options there. And I think the Diplomat too might even come with a cartridge of something. So yeah. there's a black cartridge or yeah. something like that in there. So there's another color as well. Um, but yeah, so I have I have um, all those options there. Oh, the Magnum also comes with a converter as well. That's part of why I chose it too. So you get a lot of bang for the buck with the Magnum. Yeah, that's plus true. Plus with the free ink too. That's so true. So that's, that's part of why I chose it as yeah. well. Yeah, so that, that offsets like any sort of like personal preference you might have. Like yeah. The, the, the value. Like it's a thinner pen than I'd normally want to right. use. But, but that value keeps it. the scales pretty even. Yeah, I thought it was worth the trade off. Fair enough. Um, okay, so Diamine Marine that's a great color that brings me up to $78.89 uh, and then I was like well I need some paper right so the go-to paper that I love is the Rhodia A5 dot pad that is seven dollars so that brings me just one pad I could have gotten probably two of those but I wanted to get a variety so um, that brought me up to $85.89 and this is all current pricing, by the way. Any of this can change in the future. If you're watching this in the future, this is as of February of 2024. Enjoy your hoverboards. That's right. Um, so then the other one that I went with, I went with a Goulet notebook, which has Tomoe River paper in it. That it does. And I went for the 68 gram, so slightly thicker, A5 lined, staple bound. So good all around notebook, handy for all kinds of different situations. Um, and I went with lined because I already had the dot. And then, you know, the lined, if I wanted to use the Eco that's got the broad nib on it, I've got a little more room to work with. Wise. Whereas the dot is only five millimeter, you know, but um, I thought that was good. And the lined is, the line on that paper is not like harsh lines, you know, they're pretty subtle. So I thought that that worked pretty well. And then especially if I wanted to use that Eco with the broad nib, especially with something like the Marine or honestly, Blue Skies shades pretty decently too that shading on the Tomoe with that Eco Broad, I mean, come on, yeah. it's gonna look awesome. So I thought that was a good combination. So that brings me up to $93.89. And the sales tax in Virginia is 6%. So that was, oh, you know what? As I do in my math here, I think I realized a flaw in my plan. Well, yeah, there's no online sales tax, right? Uh, no, there is sales tax, because there's sales tax in like 45 different states. Oh, that's right, that's right. But I don't think the sales tax is counted in the free shipping. That was my flaw. I was so proud of myself, because with $5.63 of sales tax, that brought me to $99.52. Oh. But I don't qualify for the free shipping because of the sales oh, tax. Oh, no. Dang it. I'm so sorry. Dang it. 
So I don't you know still what to did do a about great that. Job. I guess I would have to now, now. I would have to take out one of the notebooks no, and no, pay no, no, for no, shipping. No, 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 no. Lord Water Bottle says, "Look, that little symbol that I don't know what it means. It says about you know whatever that symbol is. It about a hundred dollars. About a hundred dollars. So you're still fine. Okay. The, well, I would. The good Lord Water Bottle is not going to come after you. Okay. Well, then I would I would have to add something enough to cover the sales tax, I guess. Or you could just um, stop there. You're you're still around a hundred. Well, I'd have to get the free shipping. That's the thing. I'd have to hit the at least hit the free shipping. Okay. Right? So if I and then the sales tax would put me over. You grab another varsity. I feel like I got close enough, right? Yeah, like, absolutely. Give me credit. absolutely. Okay. So I would throw another yeah, another couple of varsities or maybe another bottle of like Dimine ink, you know, that's eight bucks or another probably another Rodeo Dot pad, honestly, would do it. Seven mm-hmm. seven bucks. That'd get me within a dollar or two and then a little bit of sales tax, but then you know, I'd be Definitely under 110, you know, shipped with tax and everything. Yeah. So that's, I feel like that's 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 good enough. Absolutely. Cool. That's a good so batch. Yeah, that's my selection. All right, that's a pretty decent selection. Nice variety. Again, that's my style. Like I even know, even now, knowing what I like, I mean, part of what I like is variety. So even if I was starting over again, I would still elect to get variety. Except arguably maybe on the ink because I just love blue and yeah. half my inks are blue. But anyway, yeah. there that, you go. That's good. That's good. Is that, a, is that a decent list? Yeah, and I didn't I didn't go like with one almost hundred dollar pen either. I, okay. I did. You know, yeah, you want to get it. I stuck, get a nice yeah. little mix. Yeah, very cool. Okay. okay. Well, I'm I'm proud to say that my subtotal without sales tax or shipping okay. comes to exactly. Ninety nine dollars. Wow. Ninety nine point zero zero. So you really got like the absolute maximized thing to get the free shipping and all that. Yeah. Because you can't help sales tax. You just yeah. You know, you gotta do that. But. Yeah. But I okay. I finished nice. it. I totally by accident. I finished it and I saw that I had a dollar ninety five left. And I was like, that is the exact cost of many of our ink samples yeah. right now. So I was like, all just right, add boom. another sample on. Yep. I see like a so, huge list of samples here. Well, which I originally of course did. Makes sense. So yeah. I originally did my Drew's favorite inks in all colors uh-huh. sample set. Yeah. Um, but it was I didn't need that many. So mm. That was like you know more than ten. So uh, I, I backed off on that, saved a few bucks by picking some individual samples. So I'm going to run through my samples oh. here. Didn't do any full bottles. I thought of something, but I'll um, come back to it. Diamine Marine, um, one ninety five. Diamine Winter Spice, two fifty. Mm-hmm. Robert Oster Summer Storm, hmm. two twenty five. Okay. Private Reserve Spearmint, one ninety five. Mm-hmm. Platinum Carbon Black, two seventy five. Mm. Diamine Oxford Blue, one ninety five. Mm. Robert Oster Cafe Crema, two twenty five. And Waringal Captain Hook, two ninety five. So I've got some you know nice shaders in there. I've got mm. one light shimmer, mm-hmm. which is Winter Spice, one of my favorite inks. Mm-hmm. I've got uh, my a nice shading brown. My new favorite red, Captain Hook. I'm still in honeymoon phase on that one, so yeah. we'll, we'll see how long is it lasts. That one, is that one going to take out uh, Matador? Matador? Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I like, I love, I love saying Captain Hook. Mm. Like, I'm going to write with some Captain Hook. It just, I like the vibe. So those are my inks. Matador's um, pretty cool too. Matador is rad. I love Matador. Red Dragon's awesome as well. Yeah, it's a good Red, strong name. Red Dragon burned me though. It got crusty on me. Matador has yet to crustify. So well, you know. Um, and then I picked a Rickshaw Bagworks plush pen gadget pouch in stout brown. And that is $22 because I want something to carry my pens and my samples. And the okay. uh, that pouch is a great catch-all. You can shove anything you want in there. Okay. Um, so that's 22 And then my first pen of the list is going to be a Pilot Explorer in mm. black matte. That is $25. Black matte. Okay. Yep. And I'm going to go with a medium nib on that one. Medium. Medium nib because okay. I'm also getting a Pilot Kakuno in clear. I knew you were going to do Kakuno. Which is an extra I almost, fine. I almost put a Kakuno on my list. At $14.30, $14. man, yeah. with a Pilot extra fine. It's like, great. come on. That, that I is, almost picked that. That is outstanding. Uh, that would be a great pocket pen. So those are my only two pens, an Explorer and a Kakuno. Okay. Um, and wow. that, is, that, is, that is all I need. And that's what I would recommend yeah. that to anybody getting started. Like grab a couple of those low cost Pilots. That's a, that's a pilots. strong start. Yeah, Pilots super reliable too. So like yeah. you get a very consistent experience with yeah. those nibs. And I've got my extra Fine. I've got my medium. The mm-hmm. medium's still not like it's not. It's gonna, not a gusher. Not a gusher. Ain't but, no Twisby Broad, that's for sure. Right. It's going to get know. the job done. And then my <laughs> Kakuno with an extra fine. That's going to be my tolerable with crappy paper sort of pen. You know, going out and about, traveling. You know, who knows what sort of paper you're going to encounter. And those nibs are identical, so you can actually swap them between that the two I can. pens. So that I can. If you don't, if you don't want to carry that Kakuno around, you know, you can always mix it up. Absolutely. And then for paper, I'm going to go with Maruman uh, Nemesine. I'm going to start off with the B7 notepad, which uh-huh. is a top wire bound I knew notepad. Pick, I knew you were going to pick my It is on. the yeah. back pocket pen, yeah. uh, paper. I yeah. love it so much. I go through so many of those. 
Um, and then I'm going to go with a notebook I actually haven't used yet, but I've been wanting to pick one up. It's an A6 lined to do um, notebook because I know mm. most of what I write are just reminders, lists, yeah. memory sort of stimuli, you know, from meetings, discussions, things like that. And that's usually the format I follow anyway. So I don't know why I haven't picked up one of these books. Um, the little uh, B7 notepad is three bucks. And then the to-do notepad is only $6.40. Mm -hmm. So great values there. And the paper is just as, if not better than Rhodia. It's 80 gram paper made in Japan. It's, they're beautiful notebooks and I love them. And then finally, Goulet syringes for 550 because guess what? Not going to be using converters with my two pilot pens. Going to be refilling cartridges on those. Yeah. They both come with cartridges. That's all I need. I'm not going to be messing around with converters. Mm -hmm. And then a bulb syringe, of course, because if you start, mm. that that's the only flaw I see in your list is the lack of bulb syringe. Yeah, but I'm, I'm taking a little more of the approach of like, I'm going to stick with more like the bottled ink and not change the colors quite as often. Oh, okay. You know? All right. Especially because right. I didn't put it in my budget. So I will only have three inks to choose from. <laughs> three true. inks and three pens. That's so, true. And your inks you know. aren't so vastly different. Other than Red Dragon, you know, you got, yeah. you know, two blues. But yeah, so there's my list. It comes out to exactly $99 and zero cents. Nice. It's pretty solid. I almost, you know, we were thinking along the same lines when I originally came up with my list. I almost had like a preppy and a Kakuno and the, going with like the ink syringe thing. And mm -hmm. I was like, I can just refill. Because the thing is, the, the preppy is a great pen. It's very affordable. Mm -hmm. But the converter costs like, like twice the amount of the pen. Crazy. So it was like, okay, you either need to like eyedropper convert it or refill some cartridges. They've got a great cartridge to refill. That cartridge is freaking, it's like a tank. Yeah. You can't destroy that thing. You also can't squeeze so, it to prime it. So No, you can't. Um, so that one will last forever. Mm -hmm. So that's a good, that's a good option too. If you're trying to save some bucks, um, you could just go with, honestly, you could go with a few different preppies with different nib sizes on them. You know, that was another route I could have gone. Um, but I didn't. So <laughs> obviously there we go, but yeah, very solid. So there you go. Lord water bottle. All right. Hopefully that was a deep enough dive. To me, it didn't feel like a deep dive because I didn't feel like I fell down some rabbit hole of academic scientific papers that I didn't understand. Well, I got scared, but the, the, the day is young. <laughs> yes. Yes, indeed. This was more like a, you know, uh, uh, diving off the diving board into, you know, you know, it's like I can still touch the bottom if I do like a pencil dive. Sure. You know, that kind of a thing. But I'm not like in the open ocean with waves cresting over my head. Yeah. <laughs> we got back to the surface quickly. We did. Which is nice. That was fun. Fun question. Thank you for asking that. That was a lot, of, a lot of good stuff. All right. This is from Gummy Bear 1972. How to deal with loved ones who don't get our love of fountain pens and think it's a waste of money. True. Well, Gummy you have, Bear. You have no experience with this, do you? Everyone in your life just totally gets... My wife could not care less. <laughs> um, all right. Here's the difference. Um, they don't need to get it. First off, if you, it helps it, it maybe it, it depends. Yeah. It, you also don't, you don't, you shouldn't care what people think. Um, if they're legit curious, then that's one thing. Then yes, there are things you can do to help them understand. Mm. But if they are just kind of judging you thinking it's dumb and they have no interest in learning, who cares? Yeah. It, it doesn't matter. It's not your job to convince them. It's your job to love what you love, regardless of anybody else's opinion of what you love guaranteed they're into something weird that you don't care about that that that's my thing you know so um i just say the best thing you can do is just kind of wear your happiness like just show them that this is something that you love something that brings you joy and eventually they're gonna realize that it doesn't matter i mean if they really care anyway they're gonna realize it doesn't matter whether whether or not they understand what matters is that they're going to see hey this thing makes this person that i care about very very happy and regardless of my understanding or comprehension of it, I want this person to be happy in their lives. And that's what's happening. That That's really all you need to worry about. And I think sometimes we get away from that and we want somebody to understand. I've been there for sure. Because um, I've all my life been into things that, you know, it, even as a kid, before it was like socially okay to be super into Star Wars, I was wearing Star Wars shirts and I got made fun of for it. And, you know, okay, whatever. You know, my parents looked at me like I was crazy for watching Power Rangers. Like that's a ridiculous show. Absolutely. Um, and I was, and I was a little embarrassed for watching it, but the point is like, but it also taught me like never, ever try to yuck somebody's yum just because you don't understand why they like it. It's not hurting anybody. Yeah, sure. It might be silly to you, but that person's loving it. So for you, just love what you love. Let that out there because like Brian said, 
odds are, you know, if unless they're just an empty husk of a human being, they've got something in their life that they're passionate about. And if we all just kind of were open about that passion and understood that like, well, hey, you've got your thing, I've got my thing. Like, yeah, sure, I'm spending a couple thousand dollars to go to Disney World, this other person spending a couple thousand dollars to go to the Super Bowl. Like, which one is more silly? Doesn't matter. They're both neither of they're neither, both pretty silly to be honest. Exactly, but neither of them are hurting <laughs> the other one at all. It's just a thing. Passion is passion, and honestly, the world is better off for it. So have the passion. Um, and then, uh, so if they do want to, yeah, how do you uh, actually deal with them though? Well, you know, it's, uh, unless they're just basically don't. Yeah, don't like, or, or, unless yeah. they're coming after you, I still can't understand why you're writing with fountain pens. Like, just, who, who cares? It doesn't matter. Um, but uh, let's see. Um, if you do want to help them understand, then just talk to them about it, about like why you like it. Like, it's not something that you need to convince them of. You don't need to convince them why it's good. You only need to convince them why you like it. So that is all that matters. Whether or not they're curious about it, that, that's fine. They will ask about that. But the easiest thing to do, you know, which has a you know much lower barrier for entry, is just to illustrate how it brings you joy because that's something they can't argue with. There's no hole they can you know poke in that because it's just your reality. So illustrate that to them. And again, if they've got something else that they're super into, they can usually relate it to that anyway. Um, and of course, if they are interested in kind of the details, then, you know, we'll all have plenty of details to show because oh, yeah. we're fountain pen nerds, but it's a lot easier to illustrate why you love something than why someone should love the thing that you love. Mm. That's what matters most. And that's what I found in my life and, you know, having a lifetime of nerdy hobbies, it's a lot easier to do that. And then once somebody just understands it, like, Hey, this person, they are living their best life and they are just a happy human being because they've got a ton of passions that just bring them joy and they're going through their life smiling. Great. You know, if you truly care about somebody, that's the conclusion you're going to reach. So I feel like that's easier now too, especially with parasocial relationships and internet, you know, forums and social media, stuff like that. Like on one side, there's a lot more comparison and you can feel more inadequate, but on the plus side, you can connect with other people who are in kind of your situation. And this is like the best thing about the like online yeah. community. You're never alone. We're pretty much all of us deal with exactly this thing all the time. It, even if it's not like in such a hostile or kind of antagonizing manner, you know, still people are just like, I don't get the pen thing. Like, you know, a lot of people just won't understand yeah. why we're so in love with these things. You know, and that's okay. Like they won't, I mean, you, you kind of like Drew said, I, I think it's great to like try to get them to understand the why, not the what or the how, but the why behind why you love it. If it's helping you to express yourself or connect with, you know, some part of your past or something through journaling. I mean, there's a lot of things that they can understand maybe the bigger why as to why you like it. And then honestly, it's just like, I think they're cool. And I like to nerd out on specs and, you know, things like that. Like, that's fine. They don't have to really get into that. Yeah, you know, that can just be your thing. Take them to the media uh, department in Target and say, hey, guess what? There's more vinyl records now for sale than there are DVDs and Blu-rays. Like that What's right that there. all about? Yeah. yeah, it's the same concept. Like <laughs> yeah. folks just tend to gravitate toward, you know, an intimate connection with their hobbies and mm -hmm. vinyl yeah. records can do that for people. Some people think that it's insane. Like why in the world were you buying a vinyl record when you can hop on Spotify and get everything you need and more? Yeah. That it doesn't matter like why you think you don't need to comprehend why that person, you know, might do that thing. You need just need to comprehend why that person loves doing the thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, my thoughts to add. So I said, it kind of depends on the loved one. You know, if this is like a significant other of yours, their opinion might actually matter a little bit more, you know, you know obviously them being at least supportive of your interests, uh, is pretty important. Um, and also then just working in like a healthy budget around your spending. Cause that's where I would say it can start to become more of an issue. If you're passionate about something and your significant other doesn't understand it and you're spending outside of what they feel comfortable with, that can then create 
like issues um, if you're not on the same page like that. That's just normal, like kind of couple stuff. But, um, you know, it's easy if you get really passionate about a particular hobby, especially one where things can go up in price and you can spend, you know, as much as you want, basically. Um, not just fountain pens. There's so many other ways you can do this too. But uh, fountain pens are certainly one that I think we can all relate to on that one. Um, just making sure that you are having enough of that communication and understanding with your significant other so that they're supportive and that you have a healthy boundary around your own kind of budget and stuff like that. So it doesn't become more of a contentious thing. I think that's like the fine line to kind of walk there rather than just saying like, oh, it doesn't matter. You know, well, with certain people, it does matter. You know, the relationship is more important than your, your hobby in the, in the grand scheme of things with particular people. But if it's just like more casual people like parents yeah. or friends or whatever, people who like don't have a stake in it. That's more kind of like what you're getting at yeah, there. Yeah, spouses are um, different, obviously. But yeah, that's a little that's different. With, that's with any hobby. For sure, for sure. Um, and then the other thing I had was like, this is a little more of a practical thing, but like sometimes, you know, I find this especially any any kind of creative endeavor. Um, you know, there's all kinds of studies and stuff that show that, you know, it's usually around like fourth grade when kids start to become less creative because they start to get more criticism about their art. And a lot of people get burned, whether it's their handwriting or whether it's painting or drawing or some kind of creative endeavor. A lot of people kind of emotionally just get stuck in that kind of childhood, you know, I'll call it trauma. Um, if they are not in any like supportive environment in that age, um, so honestly, I think that's one of the amazing things about pens is they're a relatively accessible, relatively safe way for you to revisit that and kind of express that, um, you know, even just kind of like revisiting your younger self. And it's like, okay, you might have not had the best handwriting as a kid and felt some shame around that, but you are older now and you can enjoy that and kind of revisit that. You know, I personally have found that with music. I, you know, mentioned that I got into the saxophone again. There's no reason for me to play the saxophone. I'm not in a band. I'm not going to make any money at it. It's purely just for my own enjoyment. But it was like reconnecting with a younger part of myself. It was like, yeah, I, I really enjoyed that. So I, I think that's part of the beauty of writing is like it's a super accessible way for anybody who can read and write to be able to do that. Um, and so I think that that's something really interesting. So honestly, I think sometimes when people are criticizing that, it's actually because they themselves are probably might have some bad stuff that happened to them and their own creative stuff. Um, I think that people who are generally more open and creative in general won't, won't, I mean, I'm super generalizing here, but people who are more creative in general are, are not the ones like criticizing the pen thing quite as much. And I've, I've found that even just in my own like extended family, even if they're not into fountain pens, you know, they might be into painting or they might be into some other kind of, Art, call it artistic or creative endeavor. I never have to explain to them why I'm into fountain pens or anything. Like they don't understand the details of it, but they get they get it. They get that passion and that that drive to, you know, really pursue something that kind of grabs you. You know, so um, I think that's something. You know, we're going a little deeper on that one, but you know, don't try to therapize your whole family or anything. But you know, there could be something there. Um, so I think you need to walk a line there. But that's why I love. Pens that are really accessible, like the Varsity, something that's like stupid simple. Honestly, if, if there's like any hint of interest or compassion or empathy or whatever from a family member who doesn't really get your pen thing, just like hand them a Varsity or hand them a really simple pen and just be like, try writing with this for a little bit and just tell me it's not like a, a pleasing writing experience. And they may be like, oh, okay, yeah, I, I kind of get it. Like they may not fall off on, on the wagon, off the wagon. I don't, that's not the right metaphor. They may not fall into the rabbit hole like you, but I think they would write with the pen and be like, oh yeah, the ink does flow well. It does write pretty smooth. Okay, I get it. They're like, I don't care. I don't, want, I don't want to deal with fountain pens, but I get it now. So getting a pen in their hand sometimes might help if they're open to that. So that's my only thoughts. All right, cool. Next. Question number three comes yeah. to us from HMJ3784. And we are asked, what are top three or few most innovative pens mm. on the Goulet Pens website? So top three most innovative fountain pens, Brian. This was tough. Yeah? This was tough. I mm. had a tough time. Because, like, what do you consider innovative? Like, you know, it's very open to interpretation. I could make an argument that, fountain pens are not innovative products because they've been around for 150 years and 
more or less the technology around them hasn't changed that much. I mean, so we're like hyper focused on the fountain pen world. So innovations to us are like, there's a new material, there's a new, you know, thing, but yeah. like as a whole, it's not, it's like an iteration, not so much an innovation. If I have to be honest with myself, you know, so I have to context it a little bit. It's not like you're looking at like, you know, I'm thinking of like the world of like AI and electronics and these types of things like that world has changed so rapidly, you know, material science and, you know, chemistry and all these things that's like completely changed, you know, everything many times over very quickly, but fountain pens have just been solid and stable and not a lot of them have changed drastically. I suppose, decades. but I'm also very appreciative that someone didn't ask us for like, what's the, been the most innovative bowling ball, you know? <laughs> so we're, we're, we're okay. Like we've got stuff to talk about, you sure. know, we're, we're not Absolutely. talking about, we're not in the bowling Absolutely. hobby. So, well, I, so I say that because it's like, I have to contextualize it a little bit. Like innovative pens, like within the, within our little pen scope. Of course. Right. We're it's not like, comparing this to AI. Yeah. Cause I mean, there was a period there where they were trying to come out with like, you know, pens that you could like, you know, uh, it would like not in the, not so much in the fountain pen world, but they were like when the internet was kind of first coming about and people were concerned about handwriting going away and all this kind of stuff, they were trying to like merge digital and analog. And it would be like pens that would like record what you're writing as you're writing it kind of a thing. And like trying to shoehorn technology in there. And it's like, it's not the point. Yeah, like, we don't want I remember that. that. So that's, didn't Lamy try to do something like that at some point? They had, uh, they had something where it was like the notebook yeah. And you could like scan it or something yeah, like that. Yeah, something like that. There's been a lot of notebook. Yeah, anyway. Uh, but uh, anyway, that's what on, I consider to be like innovations. Website. Yeah, on our website. So I'm thinking of more of like, you know, what kind of stuff is being done on pens that you don't see every day? Yeah. That's how I kind of interpret it. I think it. that's so realistic. Maybe I read too much into the, the first part of it. But Probably. I think so. Um, <laughs> so anyway. Um, okay. So I, uh, I don't feel the <laughs> most confident about my answers. I feel like the ones I have are, are okay. Okay. Are okay. But there's a lot of them that like I could just as easily argue for some other pen. Okay. So I'm caveating myself. Um, so <laughs> I looked at our current stock. What we have, um, I put the Monograppa 007 Spymaster Duo. It's a five thousand dollar limited edition pen, but oh, that's okay. the one that's got the filling mechanism where you like load up the the cartridges. Oh, I didn't with know. The we still bullets. had that one actually. It's still on site. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. Cool. So that's it's cool. It's got cufflinks that like yeah. screw onto the yeah. pen. You know, it's got the it's it's just got cool filling mechanism and stuff like that. You know. So I think there's some cool innovative stuff that went into that. And Definitely. it's just not something you see every day. No, those little bullet cartridges. Like yeah. You like, you've got this like pump thing that you like fill up the cartridges with. So it's sort of like a, va like, it's sort of like a, like a traveling inkwell type thing, except it's made to fill the bullets, mm -hmm. which are themselves little ink cartridges. And then you put the bullets into the pen. That's just really cool. Yeah. I don't know. That, that, that I consider to be pretty innovative. That totally works. I don't think that all pens should have that, but it was an innovation because, especially because of like the theming of it and all that kind of stuff, it totally fit. Um, okay, the next one I had was the Peniter Forge Carbon. So that was innovative mostly because of the material itself mm -hmm. on the pen. That Forge Carbon thing is a pretty innovative material. Um, and I just think it looks amazing and it feels really cool. So that one I put on there. And the last one I had, I, I couldn't decide between two. Um, and I still can't decide. I thought maybe I'd have a stronger feeling as I got into it, but I don't. Um, so I put the Homo sapiens, Bronze Age, the lava material. Still, it's been around for a decade, but it's still pretty innovative. You don't yeah. see that a lot. And you haven't um, seen it. It's almost more impressive because no one else has done it. Yeah. Like think about it, the, the, the fact that it is so popular and yeah. is over 10 years old and no one else has come along and been mm -hmm. able to replicate the whole lava resin thing. Yeah. The bronze, you know, trim is something you don't see very often. Yeah. I like that. Um, the hook safe lock, that's really cool. So that's got a lot going for it. Um, I'm kind of into that. So I couldn't really decide between that or the Diplomat Nexus because that's got, I mean, that's got an interesting kind of filling mechanism too. It's essentially an eyedropper, but it's got some more precision kind of technology yeah. going on inside of there. I recall that's someone cool. in one of the video comments said that that's not an original system. Like there was a, there was a vintage pen that did that, but yeah, I can't recall. Yeah, probably. I can't recall which pen it was. Yeah, I don't think it's like, you know, whatever. I don't, I don't know specifically Neither do how I. different it is. Sometimes with innovations like that, it's like, you know, especially when you're dealing with like patent designs and stuff like that, 
you can get things that are sort of similar, but they're different enough that you know the pet, you yeah. get whatever. Um, but yeah, so that one that one might qualify as well. So it's like I had one pen that was like, yeah, the filling mechanism is and the design is innovative, and the other one, the forged carbon, was like, yeah, the material is really kind of cool. So that's why between the like the Bronze Age and the Nexus, I guess I would probably have to say the Homo sapiens would be a little bit more innovative as a whole, but the Diplomat Nexus is newer. I don't know. So I guess I'll just have four on my list. That's fine. Okay, so that's my list. All right. Um, I recently did a video where I talked about pen superpowers, which mm -hmm. a lot of them were kind of forms of innovation. You yeah. know, so I had a few that were a little fresh in my mind. Um, but uh, the first thing that came to my mind was the Conklin 125th anniversary Nozak with mm. its fast filler. Um, that is a new take on a, like you said, like the piston in the fountain pen world has been such like, and it's essentially identical in every pen that it's on yeah. the piston mechanism. Like, the parts might look slightly different, but you have to rotate it several times up and then several times mm -hmm. down. Conklin, again, as far as I know, there might be a vintage pen that has this that I just don't know about, but as far as I know, this is the only pen that has it in one turn. One turn up, one turn down, with just as much movement as the piston pens with, you know, that takes several turns. So yeah. to me, that was a legit innovation and an actual helpful innovation too, because mm. in that video, I explored a lot of fountain pens that had gimmicky quirky innovations yeah. that were like fun but this one was astonishingly practical hmm. so definitely this fast filler um i hope to see that on some other pens as well because i think it's a really great design and in good concept that actually is going to benefit especially if you've got a piston pen that does not disassemble that is how you need to clean it up and down over and over again until yeah. you've got all of the ink gone and with a single twist up and down it cuts down your cleaning time yeah. by you know minutes precious yeah. minutes That's so right. i appreciate that one quite a bit yeah um the Thank kaveco you. supra uh is the only pen that mm. i know that can shift between a full-size pen and a pocket pen it's not technologically more advanced but it's a clever innovative concept that again i think is legitimately helpful it borders the line of gimmicky but to me in an online world there are obviously a bunch of brick and mortar fountain pen stores out there but it is, we do live in an online shopping world. In that world where not everybody has access to go pick up a pen, try it in their hand, having a pen that can go either way, you know, a larger full-size pen or a pocket pen be delivered to you, you get to choose. You might not be shifting between mm. the short version and the long version often, but you might just settle on one version. And having that versatility, I think, is really clever and helpful to the writer. So the Kaveco Supra is one of my picks. Even though it's simple, I think it's effective and I think it's innovative. And yeah, solid. I chose the Twisby Go as well because hmm. the Twisby has, I think, a solid record of innovation. Hmm. And I mm -hmm. like the fact that with the Go and kind of similarly with the Swipe, the Swipe isn't necessarily innovative in terms of the industry, but it's innovative in mm. terms of Twisby. Like they do challenge themselves. They do try things that they don't really need to try. Mm. And I applaud them for that because I appreciate a company who disrupts themselves just to continue to add fresh elements to the industry and for the you know customer and the writers in our community. So the Twisby Go, while it is not the most successful Twisby, not everyone's favorite Twisby, not my favorite Twisby, it does something different and mm. it tries to be something new with its just kind of very durable, durability focused build quality. And it's, you know, just, it, it approaches itself with a uh, very like, hey, anybody can use me sort of mentality. And mm. that plunger system is, I've never seen anything like it. And I don't know how necessary it is, but it is trying something brand new. There's no reason for it to say, hey, this is going to be the new thing, but mm. it's trying something new. And I appreciate it for that reason. So I think it's innovative in a very fun kind of experimental sort of way. I think that it's probably safe to say that it didn't work marvelously. We've still got the same two colors that it launched with. So, you know, it didn't light the world on fire. Yeah. But I think that the concept is sound. I think what it was, it succeeded in doing what it was trying to do mm -hmm. and uh it's a fun little pen and it writes well so yeah i want to just give it a little bit of appreciation give it a love yeah yeah so cool those are my three okay solid list yeah no overlap either yeah those are good answers yeah cool what about you all do you have any comments 
Because honestly, like, we could make arguments about a bunch of other. Pens and I'm too. sure there's stuff that we don't carry that we don't have in our shop oh, that I'm is sure. super innovative. I'm sure. Yeah, absolutely. All right, moving along. I got a question from Julian. What inks would the two of you suggest for grading papers? I'm a high school teacher. Doesn't necessarily have to be read, just different enough from the student's writing. So. I was excited to answer this one because I happen to have a good friend who is also a fountain pen nerd and uh, happens to teach high school. Oh, so well, there you go. I was able to reach out to him and um, he provided me with some insight that we can pass along to, uh, who'd you say this person's name was? Julian. Julian. So Julian, I have a friend who is in your position, a high school teacher and fountain pen user. So um, this is a quote, uh, Pearl Noir from uh, Jacques Urban. Um, they say is one that dried fast and has been just a degree different than student ink and works on garbage school copier paper. Mm. So it's an important factor. Yeah, absolutely. So it's a black ink, sure, but allegedly it's different enough. Um, probably darker than whatever the kids are using because it's you know a uh, I don't liquid. Know, it depends. Ink. Well, I mean if. I mean, I feel like a lot of gel rollerball pens could be pretty dark. Yeah, maybe it's lighter. You know I, mean? I don't know, but or it just looks different somehow. Possibly. Okay. But uh, yeah, I never. I haven't used that in, since we were in the garage. Probably. Pearl Noir is a great. Ink. Yeah. It's a sleeper. I I believe that. Yeah. Like I, some people swear by it. It's like their go-to black ink. I mean, it's super low maintenance, easy to clean out of the pen, behaves really well. Yeah, I know. It, it doesn't well have any like fan, It doesn't have any like wild properties to it so it apparently it get dries fast so that's mm -hmm. that's fantastic there you go. um also recommended are sailor siboku and pilot blue black uh, both of those mm. are reportedly different water resistant and affordable and play nice on different papers mm. so wouldn't have okay. gone to those but apparently there okay. it is okay. so as far as versatile everyday paper the recommendations are jacques Urban, pearl noir sailor siboku and pilot blue black. As far as um, what my friend says, if you have good paper, then they prefer uh, Emerald of Shavor because it's got a light amount of shimmer. And then uh, Ferris will press Stroke of Midnight also with um, a little bit of shimmer. So um, those are their recommendations. Take that for what you will. But uh, I don't feel like I would have um, any more expertise to add than someone who literally teaches high school and uses fountain pens on grading papers would. So I was, yeah. I was, I was glad to uh, be able to make that connection. So hopefully that was helpful. Yeah. Um, I got some thoughts too. First off, I thought of something as you were talking. Uh, so my daughter is in sixth grade and she was telling me just, uh, this is like a week or two ago that one of her teachers, I think maybe her math teacher or something like that, um, was doing a contest of some kind uh, for kids to bring pencils in uh, to, you know, basically help the teacher because the, they don't pay for teachers supplies, as many of you know. Um, so school budgets being what they are. So uh, the teachers try to have pencils available for students that forget them. And apparently from the start of the year, which was what, like, you know, late August, so five months or so, five, five, five and a half months, um, the teacher had gone through a thousand pencils just in this, in, in this class. So every day, nine or 10 kids forgetting a pencil you know, it's like maybe half to a third of the class. Wow. Um, yeah. Halfway through the school year, a thousand pencils. And I'm like, yeah, that's some. I, at first she told me that and I was like, that can't be right. That's so many pencils. And I was like nine or 10 pens a day and pencils a day. And I was like, huh? you know, teachers got like, I think, I think teacher has like three or four classes a day. They're all rolling through. So oh it's like, God. you know, a few students a day, it all adds up. And I was like, dang, man, that's, that's intense. So yeah. If you're grading papers, keep that, keep track of that pen because those kids are going to freaking steal your stuff. Anyway, um, that's just an anecdote, but I just, just couldn't believe like that's a insane. thousand pencils in like a few months. Golly, I, I um, bet you we've got some teachers nodding their heads right now. Yes. Props to you all because that is definitely a thing. Um, but a bunch of students brought it in. The teacher got more than a thousand pencils back, so that's good. But then there's still the back half of the year. Anyway, um, so personally, I'm not like the biggest fan of red ink because it just – as a kid going through school, you know, it just re you associate red with wrong. Um, so I think it's and, I, and from talking to like other you know customers of ours who are teachers and stuff like that, a lot of them feel kind of same. You know, unless they're like trying to like 
come across as like, you know, whatever. Um, generally red is maybe not the go-to. So I think using a different color might be a good option. So I think like a green or a purple, because you're probably not going to have students that are writing in that so much. Um, might make a good alternative to red. Of course, it's totally up to whatever is acceptable in your school situation. Um, so I recommend a dye mine imperial purple. It's a pretty well-behaved purple. It's pretty vibrant. Oh, I always forget about that, that one. It's not one that gets a lot of love, yeah. but it's, it's a very solid color. Um, Private Reserve Tanzanite. Nice dark purple. It looks really vibrant too. Um, that one would be pretty good. Generally well-behaved. Um, for green, I did Noodler's Green Cactus. I don't know. Just haven't thought about that in a while. It's a very vibrant green. Yeah. Um, it would stand out, you know, pretty well. And then Diamond Sherwood Green. That one's a little bit darker, but it's just a beautiful all around green. So no crazy properties with any of these inks, um, but just really nice colors that might be something different than red to, to stand out and probably wouldn't match anything your students would have. So those are my thoughts. Cool. I just want to make sure I got Spearmint on my shopping list. Oh, Spearmint was on there. I yeah. did. Spearmint's a good color too. I don't that remember one. saying it. I'm like, wait yeah, a second. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was trying to vary up the brands a little bit in my recommendations, but anyway. Um, cool. All right. Next question, last question Oh, of the day here. Okay, yeah. Uh, this comes to us from Nick. And Nick says, hello. Hello. Why are there no glass-bodied fountain pens? Hmm. Think a Twisby Eco, but with a glass body instead of a resin one. Thanks. They'd break. All right, there we go. That was Q&A. Is uh, this a thing? Is this something people want? A glass? I don't know. Well, I mean, they like, have glass the pens. Advantage? They have glass dip pens. Yeah, but they break. <laughs> they do, but you they still sell them. You don't want to carry a glass them? pen around with you. A lot of people you use stick glass a glass pens. pen in your pocket and walk around with it. No, that ain't gonna work. No, but you don't always. Not everybody does that with fountain pens. I mean, yeah, of course not. I really. I have not put. I nobody, have, nobody uses a glass pen because they like the the body being glass. It's because of the flutes. It's because like, of the tip. It's yeah. because of the dip. You know, nature of it. Yeah, I mean. I guess it would it could be easier to clean. Uh, you know, things generally stick to glass less than they stick to plastic. Maybe. So you could make an argument for that. Glass is usually, you know, easy to clean. Maybe. Um, it is more scratch resistant. I'll give you that. Yeah. Now, I, yeah, I don't know. What, what are your thoughts? You wrote some stuff down. I, I, I deep dove it just a tiny little bit. Okay. Because it seems very obvious to me, like, well, glass shatters. Like, it would not be... And, and plus, like, if it does break, not only are you then dealing with, like, ink everywhere, but now you have, like, shards of glass that can cut and break. Like, that's not, that doesn't seem great. But I'm like, I don't know. Maybe there's, maybe there's something to it. Maybe I am just not being open-minded enough. So I looked into it, and I thought about, like, okay, the, the glass thing. So one thing I will say, I didn't go down this rabbit hole completely, but I did, it did pique my curiosity because there are, types of glass that are stronger than normal glass. Think about like your phone screens and stuff like that. You know, Gorilla Glass like from Corning and you know, other things like that. That's really, really strong glass. You know, you yes, it will break, but it takes a beating, you know what I mean? But I don't know if that type of glass can be done in like a round pen shape, you know what I mean? And this is where I didn't dive deep enough to know, is that practical? Maybe it is, I don't know. Um, so would that provide some advantages? I think the main advantages would be scratch resistance because glass is much more brittle than basically every form of plastic, um, but it is very scratch resistant, you know? So I actually looked it up. The Mohs hardness scale on glass can range from like six and a half to 7.8 or so like that, depends on that. And you know, when you get into like some of this like crystal type stuff, it can get up to like nine, like it gets really high, like really, really good scratch resistance. Uh, but the problem is impact resistance. And that's where I think you have the fatal flaw in a pen because pens get tossed around, they get dropped, you know, you have it in your pocket, you can sit on it wrong, you know, and you don't want that thing to crack or break. So I don't know if this has ever been tested this is something like somebody that knows vintage pens really well might know if there were some companies that tried to make pen bodies out of glass because i'm sure that that's been tried like way back in the day i'm sure it has because plastic technology was not the end all be all especially in the early days of fountain pens there was so much material science that was like developing in the early 1900s that i'm sure that glass was tried in pens um, but I would imagine that if it was anywhere near a viable option, you would see it 
somewhere. You would see some pens made out of glass and you don't see that anywhere that I can think of. But I could be wrong, I could be wrong. So I don't know if the tube-like structure is conducive to something like an impact resistant glass, um, but I don't know, I could be wrong about that. So I didn't deep dive on that, but it did get me curious about impact resistance. And I was thinking about that. And so I went super, super ankle deep into, uh, into a deep dive here. So um, I was thinking about like, what are pens generally made of and the impact resistance. So um, I wasn't able to find like some specific number measurements. It's probably out there, but I didn't feel like going into academic papers at this point. Um, but I did find on some plastic makers website um, that there's a lot of factors in strength, uh, you know, impact resistance, scratch resistance, all kinds of other stuff. There's like tensile strength, compression strength, all this stuff. And I was like, I don't understand quite the dynamic forces that would be at play on a pen. I don't, I don't even know yet enough to know like which of those numbers really matter the most. But what I found that gave, gave some guidance at least is that um, acrylic, which is PMMA, polymethyl methacrylate, that's commonly used in a lot of types of pens, um, has about 10 times the impact resistance of glass and is about half the weight. So when I'm thinking about what matters in a pen, impact resistance and weight savings, that matters quite a bit. So you do sacrifice a little bit of scratch resistance with PMMA versus glass because PMMA's uh, Mohs hardness is about a three. So relatively soft um, in the grand scheme of things. But, um, you know, you might get some like surface scratches and stuff like that. But the impact resistance more than makes up for it. But there's actually a far superior material for a pen when it comes to impact resistance. And that is polycarbonate. Yeah. So think about the Lamy 2000. That's made of polycarbonate. Polycarbonate has 250 times the impact resistance of glass. Dang. Think about that. That's crazy. You know? So, yeah. It's like not even close. Not even close. Not even close. And polycarbonate can be made clear. Like, it's naturally clear. So, Lummy, what are you doing? Make hmm. a clear 2000. Please. Come on. Like, if I could have anything in this world. We not, okay, not anything. If I could have anything in the pen world, a clear 2000 would be pretty awesome another, that would be pretty amazing right another pen cast where we don't get away with not mentioning <sighs> the 2000 but this legitimately came up like yeah. i wasn't even looking for it on the Lamy 2000 but when it specifically mentioned basically how amazing polycarbonate's impact resistance is i was like there Lamy it is 2000, 2000 it is. showed up there you go um so yeah that was it that's my deep dive that's all wow just on impact resistance yeah some different materials. Now, I, I tried to look at some other ones like, you know, cellulose acetate butyrate. That's what Noodler's pens are made out of. And a couple others, there's also cellulose acetate or, and uh, uh, acrylic, ac or acrylic acetate. It started to get kind of confusing. I couldn't find like the most solid information relating all these different things. So there's something there. Maybe y'all have more perspective on that. But ultimately, it boils down to every type of plastic is way more impact resistant than glass. And I just don't think that the the benefits of using glass would outweigh the trade offs of yeah. that that shattered shatteredness. I did a quick Google search just because I was curious. Like, I wanted to know more about fittings on glass because you would need hmm. to. You can't just make the whole fountain pen out of glass. Obviously, no. you need to have the barrel be glass, and then you know er, things would need to have fittings on the glass. And that 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 kind of stumped me a little mm. bit. Mm -hmm. um, so I was like, well, what shape is this? barrel going to be. It's a tube, right? I typed in glass, or it's a pipe, you know, mm -hmm. typed in glass pipe. A number of results came up for pipes to smoke various things in. Really? Um, didn't really think about- On the about, internet? Right. You know, <laughs> but, but that got me thinking. I saw a lot of these pipes and they all had metal fittings. Yeah. So, you know, threads and things like that. So, mm -hmm. and there has to be an advantage to using glass in that regard. Um, I'm guessing for- Heat. You know, he, yeah, yeah, there's heat, yeah. Yeah. But um, not they, applicable to pens. But it also doesn't, you know, get stained as much either. Sure. Yeah, so there's sure. there's that as well. So yeah. I, it, it should be able to be done. Like the manufacturing that's required to make these glass pipes can't be that much more complex than, you know, uh, you know, fountain pen, you know, manufacturing technology. So theoretically, I think you could make a glass cylinder you, you certainly yeah it was definitely you know, with, with, a, with a piston in there um yeah and i feel like if the reservoir is stout enough hmm. um 
it, the structure shouldn't be that brittle. Um, if it's, hmm. you know, the longer a glass tube becomes, the more brittle it becomes, obviously. But if hmm. it's if it's short enough, you make it you can make it thicker, you know. Yeah, you can, can make it thicker. Strength. So like, I don't think it's crazy. I, I think it's, I think it's doable. Yeah, it's just like what, but again, like the thicker you make it to, the heavier it's going to be. Yeah, but I think that if someone did want to do that and said glass fountain pen, I think that as far as like what we talked about, there are plenty of gimmicky fountain pens out there that someone's tried something new that wasn't really a direct benefit. Like think about the Delta Thirty Nine Plus One with the weight in the back. Like that's not that, that's not like going to be super helpful to anybody, but it's interesting. Yeah, and it's different and it's new and. It's it's a selling point for some people. For some people, they might want a, gla- a fountain pen with a glass reservoir. That is an interesting concept. So, what like, I, what I have to think about too, though, like when I think about glass pens, for example. Now, granted, those are handmade, yeah. so they vary a lot. I don't know that you can get the kind of precision that you need to to like think about if you have a a pen with a piston filling mechanism in it. You know, mm. can you get a glass tube that the internal diameter is? entirely consistent so that the piston seal will work perfectly on every pen. I struggle to think that that would be, I mean, I guess it's possible, but how easy would that be to do? I think it'd probably that, be pretty tough. Like, I, think the solution, plastic, for sure. I think the solution would be to um, use a double walled uh, gasket with thin uh, rims rather than one of those like kind of O-ring kind of like more rounded rims more of like windshield wiper flappy pieces of rubber you know what i mean yeah. like more more yeah. blade type uh mm. but but you know double or triple wall yeah. to kind of you know give yourself cuz it would have some you know movement it would you know kind of do mm. that up and down the walls Rather than that perfect uh, matchup, yeah, but then it might wear out more. I don't know. Yeah, it's like, what's the point of this? Like, there's really no like it. It, it would the require... benefits would have to outweigh the drawbacks. Yeah, you know whoever I mean? made this would need know. to be like glass fountain pen, and it'd be like it's the only one of its kind. I think that there would be enough people drawn to that just out of curiosity that I think it would be viable to some degree. Yeah. Um. I mean, no, it, it's no more silly than the Conklin word gauge, like. But it's interesting, right? It, sure. it, it draws you in because it's something different, something that only Conklin has. Like, oh, I want to know how many words I can write. I mean, you have pens out of nitrocellulose. Yeah. That's not any more practical. Why not? You know? Yeah. So, I don't know. Interesting. I've kind of convinced myself that it'd be cool. <laughs> <laughs> I, th- I feel like it would be a manufacturing nightmare, but... Possibly. I don't know. Yeah. If that... So, definitely some of you all are way more knowledgeable of vintage stuff than we are. If there is any glass mm-hmm. pen that's been out there, or you know that that's been tested, or any, you have any of that knowledge, please let us know. Because and to be it fair, it's not easily Googleable. I'll say that. And to be fair, we know that Forge Carbon is also a manufacturing nightmare as well. It is. Yeah, they throw out a lot of Forge Carbon. Yeah. So yeah, they've tried weird. Why it's so expensive? Yeah. yeah, for sure. Cool. All right. Well, you can email us pet questions at pencast at gooleypens.com, especially if you're an audio listener. Um, or you can just leave comments, you know, here on YouTube. You can DM us on Instagram, whatever you want. Um, uh, but either way, we will be happy to answer your questions in as meandering as a fashion as we can. Uh, so that's it for questions this week. But we do have a special segment of Meet the Team with Brian K., AKA the other Brian, arguably a smarter Brian in a lot of ways. That guy knows a lot of stuff. We all so, have our strengths. I uh, hope you all enjoyed that. And uh, let's meet Brian K. Thank you to Drew and Brian for introducing Drew and Brian. Yeah, thank you to Brian and Drew for introducing. This is the new Brian and Drew. Brian and Drew. Technically the old Brian and Drew because we're recording this in the before. Past. Yeah. So no doubt the old decrepit version of Drew that is hosting this episode of the Pencast is just boring you all to tears with his agedness. He, he got a very quick shirt change, though. Yeah, very quick. Very quick. Just happened to be the one I was wearing for the other Meet the Team segments I did. Um, Brian K. Not Brian G. Nope. So, uh, would I be incorrect in assuming that um, in your role as customer care team lead, hmm. you have answered the phone and uh, dashed some excitement, pe- people thinking that you're uh, other Brian. Yeah, it's it's really interesting to hear people try and hide their like blatant disappointment. <laughs> when they're like, oh, hey, Brian? I'm like, not the one you're thinking about. And they're like, oh, okay, well, it's so nice to talk to you no. too. And I'm like, thank you. Well, I, I'm I do, sure. I do get paid, so yeah. that's fine. Oh that's my great. God. 
Yeah, I've heard, I've overheard you say that. Like, I don't know how many times. Yeah. Not that one. No, nope, it's the other one. Yeah. But apparently, we sound very similar on the phone, which I also sound like my dad on the phone. I've never, so, I don't know if I've ever talked to Brian on the phone. Like, I'm not in the last couple of years anyway. Well, you do want to? No, but I, I haven't talked to you on the phone either. So I can't say. I'll call you tomorrow. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm sure we'll have something to talk about. But for now, we have some other stuff to talk about. So yeah, customer care team lead. So you mm -hmm. have uh, you you started on the customer care team a couple years ago, and you've clawed your way up the the ladder, and yeah. now you sit atop the uh, the pyramid, almost at the top of the pyramid. <laughs> you have to dethrone Adrian. I have to dethrone Adrian, which after she kicked me off. I mean, she there's <laughs> we just have to point her in the right direction. She could do anything. She really could. Yeah, one hundred percent. She could kill it. So <clears throat> in your current role, you still do emails, phones, and stuff, right? Uh -huh. Like oh, as yeah. as needed. Yeah. What in it? What, what's something unique to the team lead position that you do? Oh well, I have. We got a lot of leeway there. So, the the blogs were something new. That was not a direct part of the team lead, but that is that was moved into. We are blogging it up, I by the way. Do. If y'all haven't yeah. checked out our blog, go to the top of the website. It's up there now. It's easy to get to, and it looks so clean, crisp, to and right. easy to navigate than it has been. It's not. It's it's calling it a blog is almost like. Not ideal because a blog no. to me a blog ma makes me think of like the mid two thousands and just a long running list of stuff and it's not really like that anymore. No, it's it's just like a giant repository now. It's organized. The search function works very well. It's very clean too. It is super clean, and you've got the ink, you've got the pens, you've got the old videos, you've got the new videos, you've got a little bit of everything. So yes, go look at the blog if you haven't looked at the blog because there's lots of lots of fun goodies in there. But yeah. Lots of blog stuff did about oh, 30 ink reviews since when I started. So, but that is technically a, a side project. Yeah. And right now, Adrian's gone. So you are coordinating the entire team. Yes. I am the king of the castle. Yes. Right <laughs> I'm the captain. Or now. the, or the, uh, you're sitting next to the throne of Gondor at, very, at the very least. You're the steward. Yeah. Yeah. That, well, I don't want to be the steward of Gondor. He's a pretty cool character, though. I get to give him... He went out in a blaze of glory. He literally did. Yes. <laughs> he did go out in a blaze of glory. We just watched... Catherine and I just watched all of them again. So most of the time, if I watch a movie, I enjoy watching movie people eat. It's like it makes me hungry. Yeah. Like you watch like Hook or something like that. Like usually food in movies is a good thing. Yeah. Not not with Denethor. Denethor just oh, makes we're you... Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, that's not good. It's terrible. It's like watching the eat... The orcs eat. I'd rather watch the orcs eat. Yeah. Not I, Denethor. I read something online. It was really funny. It was like when they say, when they say uh, meat's back on the menu, that implies that orcs have a menu, which implies orcs have a restaurant. <laughs> I like that. It's like, like white tablecloths, mm. you know, butlers walking around, you know, white glove service at the orc restaurant. Like, what about that. legs? Yeah. <laughs> they don't need them. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, pens, Brian. So mm. you are one of the few people who actually owned a fountain pen before being employed here at the Goulet Pen Company. Yeah, I showed up to my interview with one. You did. And it you said cool. an astronaut gave it to you. Yeah, that was a long story. We don't need to get into many that. Many moons ago. But, but oh, still, God. like, it's memorable. I remember it. I remember, like, and also we were hiring another Brian. So we're like, oh, do we really want this guy? Because mm. then we're going to have to deal with the whole Brian That's thing. But you were just that good. You were that good. We're like, yep, you know what? We'll deal but the Brian conundrum, because this chap is aces. Turns out. And aces you have continued to be. Um, so, fountain pens, though. Yeah. You not only were a fan of fountain pens, but you continue to be both a fan of the writing experience, but more so than anybody else here, a fan of the engineering. Yes. Why? A well-machined piece of anything is, is worth marveling at. Just the idea, the amount of work that it takes to, especially like with stock removal, and now we're, we've moved to like additive manufacturing, printing. So that is the next step. But with taking a piece of aluminum bar stock, like what Diplomat does with the arrow, and turning it into a beautiful little cigar Zeppelin shape with the flutes that are smooth and they anodize the whole thing. It's just, they're really just lovely pieces of functional art. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's kind of like a like what a sculptor does, right? You know, taking a solid hunk of material and turning it into something 
pretty. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's pens are very sculptural, and they the the fact that they function and can also create their own art is neat. Yeah. And and you're a bit of a and you, you apply that as well because you you very much enjoy hands-on hobbies. You're mm-hmm. you're an analog guy for sure. Yeah. Like you've done like leather working. You've done woodworking. You have have you done welding yet? Not yet. That's I did it in high school, but I didn't like learn. It's probably just cuz you haven't like, needed here, to because if you needed thing. to, you like you would go do I it. I would love to weld some stuff, yeah. but among other things my... Like you, you've made wallets, you've made knife sheaths, yeah. you've made knives. Yep. Like, like, well, when did this start, and how has that sort of crafter mentality influenced your relationship with fountain pens? Hmm. When did it start? That's a good question. I always loved taking things apart mm-hmm. and then trying to put them back together. So I was a fan of Legos when I was a child, but that never really, that really panned out. Um, High school was the robotics team and the stage crew, which was building the sets. That's right. So, I, you forgot. I, you've told me about that. I totally forgot. Yeah. And that's like all sorts of different tools, like between using um, snap rivets and, you know, Wago connectors and robotics and. Wait, what connectors? Wago. Wago. Wago it's, it's the better connector for two wires. Oh. It's like got two, sorry, two little spring loaded clips. Huh. There you go. Okay. Yeah, it's magical. And then, yeah, so there's a lot of tools and fun stuff in there. And then when I got out on my own, it's just like, oh, I get to buy all the fun stuff that I never, that I don't always need. So but that you interest never know. continued outside of school. Oh, yeah. Because sometimes you, you, you might do something at school and it kind of, because it is an academic thing that you were made to do, mm-hmm. it kind of like sours your your kind of opinion of it and kind of makes it so you're not able to then apply fun to that thing but for you that didn't happen you just you were like yep this is something i want to continue doing yeah those were both elective mm-hmm. things that those were both after school oh okay so, oh after school yeah oh, okay. and by my senior year i was taking two art classes so i had two physical art classes a day and then would leave and go build stuff put stuff together tear stuff apart it was great and then you always need various tools and you can't see in a dark theater without a flashlight and you can't cut wires without a knife Knives and flashlights being two things that Brian is uh, very much a fan of. Mm-hmm. And overall, like, that's interesting because y- the practicality of this, like, you know, your hobbies, like, I've got some useless hobbies. Mm. I've got some very useless hobbies. Your hobbies are still grounded in practicality. Mm-hmm. Flashlights, folding knives. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you're, the things you make, you know, out of leather or wood, like those are all very practical things. Yeah. Um, where do you think that that sort of, and you you reuse, you save, you uh, like. Um, like cut the leather off a couch on the street. I wasn't going to go there, <laughs> but, but yeah, like um, where do you think that comes from? Well, I mean, that specifically comes from Jimmy Diresta. So shout out to Jimmy if you're watching anything on YouTube. He's a huge... Have you seen him? I don't so, I don't know. One of the best YouTubers for... He did one of the first videos where... And he still does it, where he speeds up the whole process of making something. Oh. So he films it and goes... All the way to the end. But yeah, that's where that came from. But the practical side of things, uh, it's a lot easier to justify buying something new when it's got a physical purpose, because can you see in the dark? I cannot. I can because I got flashlights everywhere. Literally everywhere. Yeah. They got one in my pocket. And you've got one at your desk. Yeah, one at my desk, one Speaking the car, of your desk, whatever. Brian. Uh. <laughs> Speaking of your desk, <clears throat> I just, Bri- Brian is a very <sighs> interesting person. And these hobbies that he has, they really are everywhere. They're not just like, oh, let me go home and put together, you know, a Gundam model or play some video games. Like, Brian's interests are he is enveloped within them at all times um my desk is a mess so i wanted to take i took a picture and i wanted to ask you about a few things here on your desk uh you have a jar of cookies at your desk yeah can you explain to me why that's there uh apparently when you spend thousands of dollars on getting your windows redone by a certain company, their thank you gift is, is a, a jar, jar of cookies. 
I could have asked for that as a discount. I would have been happier. The wow. cookies are good, though. Gotcha. But they're small, so it's like this big jar of tiny cookies. And then uh, you have about five different vessels of various shapes, sizes, and uh -huh. contents. We got the pickles. One of which is pickles. Yep. Um, and those were your uncle's pickles, correct? Those are my uncle's pickles. So I, see, 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 why yeah. do I know this? Why do I know this about Brian's desk pickles? I don't know. Mm -hmm. But yeah. I mean, you can't walk by and not be like, why do you have pickles on your desk? And they've been there for like two years. Yeah, right? they're, they're almost six years old. <laughs> yeah. There are children younger than my pickles. <laughs> I feel like I'm talking to other Brian at this point, just kind of like trying to deduce some reasoning behind your they, behavior. They are a perfect height stand for my computer. Don't you dare! When I when I put it up to do a meeting Don't. and I put my head or if I film a video, you do for not one put your you computer on six year old people. jar of pickles. But they're perfectly stable <laughs> and sentimental. Yes, yes, um, th that that is very true. Oh my god. Okay, um, and then. Uh, Let's see. There is Fisherman's Friend. What is that? Yeah, that's a funny picture because it's two thing, giant things of Hershey's chocolate, which came from a lovely customer, uh, Grant. Shout out to Grant and all of the kids out there. Um, love you guys. The chocolate was from them. And then on top of that is my Fisherman's Friend, which are a throat lozenge. They're like super menthol, like blast you in the face menthol. So... Fisherman's Friend. Yeah, they're really good. Okay. This episode is not sponsored by Fisherman's Friend. And there's a coat hanger. Just yep. a, you know, random coat hanger. It's not a it's not hanging from anything. It's shoved into <laughs> it's shoved into a paper file holder. Well, you'd never know. It's funny because all the jackets are just draped over the back of my chair. <laughs> yeah, I think you've got like two layers of jackets on well, your Well you can't put the coat hanger on the floor because that's the number one cause of slips, trips, and falls. <laughs> Oh my god! I mean, yeah, there, there's there's a lot going on here, and it's not it's like it's not particularly messy because you know, like you've got a lot of work going on, and yeah. I'd be no one to talk because my my desk is quite messy. But at any given time, there's something conversational about your desk going mm -hmm. on. Yeah. Um, apart from flashlights and folding knives, what would you say is your other like? What do you say is the longest running hobby you've had, or potentially collection, if you want to define it in that way? I mean. So my father used to say, if you got more than three or something, you're a collector. So, well, yeah, I'm sure he would still say that, but he hasn't, he hasn't tried out a new hobby in a while, but he's got like 30 guitars. I know he's a watch guy too. He's got so many watches that when you walk by that desk, you can hear them all cacophonous. That is a cacophonous. Yeah, that is absolutely a cacophonous. Yeah. And so like the, my parents' house in the middle of the night, like you walk into the main room where his desk is and it's like tick, 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 everywhere. Um, so watch. Yeah. So it probably mostly came from him. Do you think that's like, going to be you in uh, 30 oh, years? That's me right now. <laughs> <laughs> Not watches, but I, at some point he also likes to say, oh, they're all going to be yours one day. You know what though? So, I will say I have, we, you know, we're both nerds and we've both talked a lot about hobbies and various mm -hmm. rabbit holes. You are quite measured though. Like you still, now maybe, maybe it's the, what you said about how like, you have to wait until it's justifiable mm -hmm. and having them be useful is your way to do that. But you're, you don't go off the rails with your hobbies. Like you've repeatedly told me, I, well, I won't be doing that because I don't have the space. A lot of people would not say that. Mm. A lot of people would say space be damned. I'm, you know, we're, we're doing this and this is, I'm just, I'll find, I'll find space. I, I would get in trouble if I put a 3d printer on the kitchen table. That's what we were talking about most recently. Yeah. yeah. It's not going to happen. <laughs> no, I don't, I don't need it. I don't need it. And that's the question. So like one of my New Year's resolutions a couple of years ago was to not uh, bog myself down in research and just buy the thing. Yeah. And then this year, I think it's to be more decisive and probably like turn back the just buy the thing a little bit. Mm. So uh, the decisiveness will help. But yeah, like as far as practicality goes, like I could like you can lie to yourself all day long that you need another flashlight in that room or that if you're five feet away from your knife you need one at your desk but when they're all in the drawer over there and for the pens that's tough because like i got a lot of pens you do what's your favorite uh what are you having up right now god i have i have multiple times asked brian 
you know, if he has something unique, I've asked him, do you also have one of those in your car? And the answer is often yes. Uh, these are two pens we don't carry. That's all right. Okay, great. Uh, one from Mr. Ian Schoen. This is the Schoen Design Pocket 6. Oh, yeah, in brass. Uh, in brass, yes. And this thing has been in my pocket since I got it from him at the DC show. Really nice guy. Oh, tremendous. I loved talking to him. He, Because um, I immediately told him that I loved the... He puts this really light chamfer on the end of the cap and the body so it doesn't technically meet in a like a finger pinching space. Mm -hmm. And he was like, wow, I can't, like, that's really cool. That's you were the first person to that. introduce me to the word chamfer. Chamfer. It was like within the first uh, couple of weeks, we were talking about a Monty Winfield pen. Yeah. And, and you said something was chamfered. I'm like, what is that? Yeah, people had to ask me how to spell it. But yeah, so there's that guy. And then <laughs> the other one, this is what this was also a mild creation from the DC pen show. This is a Jin Hao X350. What is on the band there? Oh, it's Washi. That's, that's a, a prototype of... Goulet pens washi tape. Why do you have it wrapped around the middle of a gin house? Oh, because you know, the washi tape's so soft and like barely sticky, you just put it everywhere. And you just said, I'm going to wrap my pen in washi. Yeah, yeah. All right, Brian, this leads me to what's an inevitable question. Your pen uh, proclivities. Oh. Uh, there have been times where I've mentioned on the pen cast that Brian K has been known to put things mm. where they didn't belong. Where they don't as belong far, as, far as, <laughs> as far as pens go. As far as pens go. As far as pens go, yeah. <laughs> so I've most recently, did you, have you done anything crazy to that one? This is the one with the stipula nib on it. Oh, that's the one with the stipula nib. So this is a, a $12 Jin Hao pen with a 14 karat gold stipula nib on it that I paid good money to have Matthew Chen. Shout out to Matthew. Hey, Matthew. Oh, uh, no. Instagram? Hey, Matthew is a different Matthew. Matthew Chen is um, uh, Pactagon on Instagram. Pactagon. Yeah. Yes. Okay. To, or Matthew Matthew's nib works, I think. Um, we'll find out. Yeah. Um, but he ground this for me. I asked him to make it look like a sailor. And then um, he was right next to Jim Hines. Mm -hmm. And he's like, guys, check out this. Guy's got a stipula nib on his Jin Hao. And he leans, Jim Hines leans over. He's like, you know what? <laughs> like, why would you do that? <laughs> it's all about the nib. So yeah, that's a Franken said, pen. And then you said, let me wrap it in washi tape. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a $12 pen with like- But it's kind of not. It's not anymore. No. No, it writes great. And you've put a vanishing um, point nib inside of a preppy. Inside of a preppy, inside of an Ahab. Ahab, that was When we were talking about- Gross. When we, we were talking about, yeah, I'm offended. Uh, when we were talking about 3D printing the other day, I was just telling him how I thought it could be practical. And the first thing this man says is, man, the only thing I can think about is 3D printing something that would allow me to put a vanishing point nib in anything. Yeah. Like that's where your brain went. Yeah. If you could get one of those, because it, it run, you run into dimensional issues because it's usually the back of the vanishing point is like the same thickness as like the outside diameter of the threading for most sections. Okay. So you can't just like obliterate a hole through there and shove it what? in. You got to print a new section for it. <laughs> okay, if you could put, <laughs> if you could put a vanishing point nib in any pen, <laughs> what would you do? I'm really afraid of this. You put in a Lamy dialogue. Oh my god! That would be god. really bad. No, that's not practical. Um, what would I put in? Anything we have here? I'll just go with that. Oversized Dolce Vita. No, actually, that, like I would super girthy grip section. I would put it into one of the shown pocket sixes because it would fit. Because if you cut the back end of where the converter goes in, you lose about half an inch. And then you could use the tiny cartridges that come with the Pilot Petite that are like oh. that big. And you could pop that bad boy in there and oh you would God. have a pocket. What about the, what is it about the vanishing point nib that you love so much? It's a, it's one of the best Pilot Gold nibs. I mean, it's good. It's, it's really good. It's really slim. It's cute. <laughs> it's just slim and cute. It's slim and cute. You can buy them. Yes. Okay. Okay. No, that's yeah. very practical. And again, we, 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 this is Brian y'all like this is yeah. Brian is extraordinarily, extraordinarily practical. We joke that this man will put anything in an omelet. Yeah. Like he, he is, he is a fan of, a, of some leftovers and uh, he's made French fry omelets. I don't know how many times. And honestly, you've converted a few people to the French fry omelet, haven't you? Yes. And we can thank my father for that as well. Yeah. Yeah. French fry omelet. Like when you don't eat all your French fries at the restaurant, Take them home in a box, chop them up the next day, frying pan, eggs over top, French fry omelet, the fromlet. That's really there good. You, you can go. put anything in an omelet. 
I've heard you say this before. Almost. <laughs> I've seen my some, dad put leftover Chinese have, food in an omelet. It's like egg for young. Yeah, yeah. Have you had some omelet like disasters that you will oh, not re- there was the Tell one. Me I one. sent Tell you a photo of one of them. You did. It was the one where I don't I remember made, what was in it, but it upset me. It was leftover pasta, but it was like Oh a, god. It was rotini and it was uh not regular real pasta. It was like lentil or chickpea <laughs> pasta. And turns out I'm mildly allergic to lentils. So I ate this omelet and it didn't settle well. Also, the texture of those noodles is like like wet but still <laughs> stiff cardboard. Oh my god, yeah, pasta omelet. Bad. Pasta omelet. <laughs> yep, some things just shouldn't be uh shouldn't no. be done. No. All right. Well, Sometimes now we know. So be. you've you've both empowered <clears throat> our audience with the fromlet mm-hmm. and you have both you know used your own uh physical, you know, uh defeat as a cautionary tale. Yeah, don't um, do that. So be cautious with your omelet exploration everybody. Mm-hmm. So says Brian K. Well, that is, uh, I think, most of our time. Let me just make sure I didn't have any more questions that I definitely wanted to to get. No, I feel, I mean, obviously, you know, we talk a lot. I could talk to you for days about this, but uh, we'll definitely bring you back on because you are Woo-hoo. a wealth of information, um, especially as it pertains to, um, you know, you are not a machinist by any means, but you do understand what makes good operational quality in yes. terms of mechanics. So um, yeah. like I've asked him so many questions about, you know, folding knives and things like that. And he, he knows a good chunk of stuff. So he's again, he's a useful nerd. He's a nerd that like researches stuff that can be then used in practical ways throughout your life. Right I'm one of those useless nerds that can just rattle off, you know, inane trivia uh, to no seeming benefit. So uh, <laughs> it's nice having him around for sure. Um, but you're still stuck with me. So <laughs> With that, should we give it back to Brian and Drew? We should give it back to Brian and Drew. It's Brian and Drew signing off. Brian and Drew signing off. Back to you, Brian and Drew. Have fun, Brian and Drew. So there we go. All right. Thank you, Drew. Thank you. What Drew an interviewer he is. Hopefully Brian. he didn't interrupt Brian as much as he interrupted Ethan. I got some feedback on that. I need to be better about interrupting. Okay. Well, I haven't seen it. Sometimes I just so can't well. help myself, though. <laughs> Trolling me. Trolling me. All right. So um, that's the mildly educational portion of it. And now we're going to get into the not at all educational portion with what's happening. So Drew, what's happening? Okay. What what's... has been happening? It's been yeah. a couple weeks. Yeah. So um, I guess I won't go too far into the past week. The big thing that happened the week we were off is mm. my wife, Shannon, performed in front of a theater with the Richmond Symphony. Like, wow. she was the headliner. She was up there singing Patsy Cline with the symphony behind her. It was amazing. absolutely an incredible thing wow. for, for me to see. And then, you know, for her to see the pictures because, you know, she's there. She sees a, a familiar theater, but behind her is something completely new and different. So that wow. was that was just, you know, incredible. She was beautiful. She sang just as beautiful as she looked. It was just, just an, an incredible, wow. beautiful awesome. moment. And Archer paid attention the whole time. You know, really? he was he was focused. Even when it was just the, the symphony, he was wow surprisingly laser focused. So... Yeah, that was that was an amazing experience for me. Super, hmm. super proud of her. She's had this is like the fourth show in a very, very short amount of time for her, and it was the biggest one. So, yeah, um, very thankful that she's able to take a take a break, but That's also awesome. very proud of everything she's accomplished. Um, I bought in, in fountain pen news. I bought a pen case. <gasps> I bought a, an Estabrook Canvas Forty pen case. Oh, I've been wanting one of those for a we while. We want to consolidate for a minute. Yeah, I thought I had closer to forty pens, but I think I need another one. <laughs> Which is a shame because I don't want more than 40 pens. I think 40 mm. is a great amount. I don't need more than 40 pens. You don't want more than 40 like pens as a whole number, but each of those individual pens, you're I like, know. well, I do want that one. I and know. I do want that one. And I do want that one. Yeah. I yeah. So anyway, I, I, I have like, you know, all my retros and all my lommies and a separate thing. So, but I have all okay. like kind of the more, you know, the pens I use more in the, in the 40 case, but either way, okay. love the case. That case is super great. It, has like when it's filled with 40 pens, it feels so solid. Yeah. And I, I, I'm not surprised, but I kind of am because it is a longer pen case. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of the weight is it's stressed. Like a, it's like a restaurant menu yeah, style. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. The weight is stressed in a different way than the more compact cases are. Because yeah. 
So I, I was concerned, like, you mm -hmm. know, is that kind of more narrow, elongated design going to be okay once it's, you know, heavy? And it totally yeah. is. It still feels super solid, mm -hmm. super rigid. Um, very happy with that case. So hooray for me. Um, and then uh, I checked my purchasing history mm -hmm. and realized that I bought the razors for my safety razor over a year ago now. Yeah. So Okay. You've been keeping up with that? I have been. Yeah, that's all I've been doing. I haven't used any sort of disposable cartridges or anything like that. Okay. So if you remember that I was mentioning it on the pencast, I switched to using a safety razor and uh, I bought a pack of blades over a year ago on February 8th. And how much, I how much is on a pack? Is it five blades? It's a hundred. Oh, a hundred blades. It was $10. Okay. Wow. And I still have plenty left. Wow. Like it is so ten dollars a year for shaving yeah That's pretty good now granted i have i bought the soap too you know yeah so yeah. that didn't the soap didn't last me quite a year well argu but, arguably you would use that anyway like you gotta yeah shave with something yeah. so yeah like mm -hmm. that is such an affordable way to go and that's all i want you know I've, i'm still using them they're still great i've probably got another like you know they come in like packs of five but it's a box of like 10 of those packs or something like that but yeah yeah, yeah. uh yeah that's still happening super glad I cut myself less and less each time, still figuring it out. But uh, yeah, that's still a thing. It's been a year now. So right. I've successfully saved the money I wanted to save. So nice. Happy, happy about that. Uh, my son's birthday happened over the weekend or happened over the week. You know, yeah. it was technically on Monday, but he turned 10. Whoa. I have a 10 year old. That's a big one. That was a big one. We wanted to have, um, since we got a Disney vacation coming up, which is obviously expensive as heck, um, we told him, we're going to celebrate you at Disney let's just have a couple kids over and yeah. when you have just a couple kids and you know two out of four can't come that means it's kind of like pointless like one kid yeah yeah so unfortunately availability didn't work out so we mm. still tried our best to you know give archer a good weekend so we were like hey where do you want to eat what do you want to do he wanted to go to dave and buster's so we took him to the arcade mm -hmm. Um, he wanted uh, to have fondue, so we took him to the melting pot. Uh, oh. Had a really fun. Um, uh, we actually did lunch there, but that was a ton of fun. He was so happy. He just he even sat there and just kind of you saw him kind of process the moment in appreciation. And I'm like, man, I just mm. I, I, you know to have a ten year old like just sit and be appreciative of his parents and doing things for him <laughs> that you know cost some money, but. Like I just that's all you that's all you want is yeah. just to have an appreciative kid. So yeah. that just meant the world to me. That's cool. Um, we went over to my grandmother's house uh, as well because you know we always have like mm -hmm. family birthday events. Mm -hmm. I have a pretty small family, so it's really easy. Oh, yeah, we to... celebrated Joseph's birthday like five times. It was ridiculous. Yeah, he, he, they, don't, they don't care. <laughs> yeah. So we went over there. My grandmother made him a little cake, and of course he wanted pizza again. So we got more pizza. You know, I got to see my mom, my brother. So that was always, that's nice. always very pleasant. It's a very, very chill evening when we go over to my grandmother's house. So we did that. Um, I did buy him a new uh, VR game for the uh, Quest 2. He wanted a, there's a game called Lego, um, Lego something. But, you know, it's an interactive building game where you're in like, you have a little guy that you're, you know, controlling, but you also mm -hmm. have to build things to help him traverse the landscape. Yeah. So when you go into build mode, you know, you literally are picking up blocks <clears throat> and placing them and building something. Like and then, a virtual world. But then that build goes into the into the world and then you're like, oh, crap, no, that that, that bridge didn't hold up. Let me try again. Okay. Um, making sure that the support structure is sound. Um, and uh, he's having a blast with that. So he did that. Um and then, uh, yeah, a couple little things, nothing, nothing big because we are going to go to Disney. Um, but I did have a Nerf battle with him. He wanted to do that. And I bought some, uh, Nerf guns for myself because I need to make sure things are fair. Uh, <laughs> so I found fair for who? For me. For you? Yes. <laughs> Cause he just, he, he will just charge at me. He doesn't like react to the shots. Like I do. If I get hit, I'm like, Oh God. He just, yeah. but I shoot him. He just keeps on coming. I'm like, come on, man. This is a, yeah. this is a simulation. Give it's me like something. Superman. Just so, like, so, bang, so I need to, shows. I need to, and I need to regulate. So I found for just $11.99 a piece, two like Ninja Turtle blasters. Okay. And they're, they have revolving drums in them. So there are five shots each, but they are, they have hammers. So they're one handed operation. So I can just pull back on the hammers with my thumbs. And boom, 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 boom. Like. Yeah. Double. So I've got like 10 <laughs> handheld and I feel like a cowboy. Yeah. Blasting my son. Um, but uh, I did injure myself because he was coming at me with one of his freaking full auto, you know, motorized assault weapons. And yep. uh, I decided to 
kind of leap over our bed. Um, but it's too wide. I can't just do the one hand, you know, you know, car hood hop. Right. I, I did need to get up and I just slam my head on the ceiling fan, oh. the, the glass uh, oh, thing. Gosh. I didn't break the glass. Wow. But, uh, you know, it hurt. I fell on the ground and uh, he decided to just keep shooting me in the head. So <laughs> the compassion, you know, wow. was, was, was there. Okay. So uh, I just was like trying to just throw darts at him at that point. It didn't, it didn't work. I was wow. totally destroyed. Um, but, uh, and, and then his birthday gift, um, did buy him another Nerf gun, which, um, seems to be the thing he's mostly interested in these days. He's like the it's, perfect age for it. I yeah. mean, I totally get yeah, it. He's having a blast. He's got a, he, my, my mom got him a mask that he can wear for protection so I could shoot him in the face without worrying too That's much. That's kind of cool. Cause I usually try to not shoot him in the face. He doesn't care. He'll shoot me wherever, <laughs> but, um. I mean, he's a lot smaller than you and has yeah. less life experience. So yeah. Yeah, it seems like the way to go it for is, him. You but know, no, I I asked him. I was like, <laughs> "Did I shoot you in your face a bunch?" He's like, "Yeah, you shot me in the face like three times. Like it would have gone in my eye." I'm like, "All right, cool, good." Um, but you're awesome. protected now. Excellent. <laughs> I don't have to care. But uh, I got yeah. him a. Uh, um, we got him a massive Nerf blaster that mm-hmm. is a replica from um, one of the Star Wars blasters from the Mandalorian TV show. Cool. It's almost as tall as he is. <laughs> My gosh. Yeah. That's wild. So he's been enjoying that and mm. uh, making the dogs bark because they, they, I don't know if they know that when a Nerf gun uh, gets fired, they hear me like scream and, you know, stressful pain or if they just don't like the pops. I don't know. Either way, they bark at Nerf guns oh, now okay. and um, it's obnoxious and annoying. Wow. So, yeah, that's a thing. I'm just picturing what this event is like. As like a well, fly we do it. On the wall we we do it house. upstairs, and the dogs stay down. So, it's basically just us going nuts, me overreacting to everything. Mm-hmm. Um, and then your dog Shannon downstairs, out, downstairs, yelling at the dogs to shut up. Um, <laughs> she was getting mad that we had to stop because, like, she was losing it because th- these dogs just would not stop, and yeah. she's just sitting there trying to like play on the switch or be on her phone and <laughs> they relax are, and they are just know. losing it. Three dogs barking incessantly. <laughs> oh gosh. Yeah. No, it was obnoxious. So, wow. you know, we got, we got some good game games in. Um, I always, I always create a playlist for the battles. You know, I've mentioned that before. I use oh, the yeah. Harry Gregson Williams. Usually this time I went with, you know, a compilation of final fantasy, uh, battle mm. music. Oh, so, you know, I just went through all the final fantasies. So solid, fast paced nice. music. Yeah. Can I also recommend uh, anything from the Sonic Frontiers soundtrack? Oh, okay. I'll keep that in mind. Very much like a heavy metal screamo kind of a oh. vibe. Oh, yeah. my. It's pretty epic. Is it just, is, does it actually have like vocals? Oh, yeah. What? Oh, it's got lyrics and everything. Oh, it's my God. Fantastic. It's re- legit good music. But my kids love it. And they, it's an epic game. Like, it's all these battles with these epic bosses and stuff wow. like that. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's pretty great. All right. Well, I actually might even explore that game because he wants a Sonic game, but I don't even know what's good these Sonic days. Sonic Frontiers is it's tough. Yeah. It's not a it's not a little kid game. Oh, but he might get know, mad at that. I don't know. Dude loves giving. Try up. a demo of it. Okay. Try a demo on uh, the Switch. All he wants to play is Fortnite now. Oh, but yeah, you know, it's mm-hmm. still it's better than Ro- better than Roblox. That was the old yeah. thing. So I'm like, all right, that's fine. At least it's made <laughs> by game developers. I don't right, know. I'm right. not going to split hairs. Yeah. But yeah, right now we're just getting ready for Disney. So yeah. Shan's shows are done. We just got to get through this week. Yep. Archer's got like some Jamestown book that he needs to make. I, I stained a bunch of paper with tea all night last night. So nice. we got to go by Michael's, pick up some like period accurate thread twine of some sort, bind that together. Got to get that done. But then after that, it's Disney. Got to get the house sitter all set. Dog list of dog things to do. And, uh, and then we'll be on our way. Wow. Yeah. Exciting. Yes, we are super excited. We'll do a little bit of Archer birthday celebration while we're there. We're going to go to the T-Rex Cafe and let him nice. get one of those obnoxious desserts that have the dry <laughs> ice going all over your food. That's fun. Which he'll probably freak out about and say, "I can I? are you sure this is safe to eat now? And we'll you see. never know. He's 10 now. He's matured. Oh, mm, yes. Yeah. We'll see. We'll it's weird. See. It's weird. All of a sudden, the kids, will like at least our kids, like, They'll, you'll just be like, oh, I know how they're going to react to that. And then they just don't all of a sudden. You're like, oh, they're like over that now. Oh, that's cool. I look forward to that. Yeah. He did casually lose a tooth uh, yesterday. Yeah. Just came out in an apple. No big deal. Okay. Didn't freak out about it, which I'm like, yeah. dude, you have freaked out about so much less than that. But I'm not going to argue. This is great. Ellie lost a tooth a little while ago too. Like yeah. a week or two ago. Oh, wow. Yeah. 
Yeah, they had like a a church. They had like a glow. It was called a glow party. So oh. it was just like black lights and glow sticks, and you know everybody brought white shirts and they decorated them and stuff. It just played music and whatever. Um, but yeah, she was like eating a piece of cake and it just came and it out. Just in the came cake. out in the cake, and she was like. She was like, something kind of crunchy uh-huh. in there or whatever, and then she spit it out. I was like, oh, there's, a, there's my tooth. At his Just, after school facility, they actually had a little green plastic, like, tooth holder. Yeah. Like, I guess, you know, because there's a bunch of kids, and kids lose teeth, and they have these little... Sure. Like, we never had that at school or anything like that. No. No. It's interesting because Rachel's mother kept all her baby teeth, and at some point, this was like maybe five years ago, you know, because I think like she's, you know, trying to, she's thinking about her mortality and trying to like purge things that she doesn't want to store Do anymore. you want your teeth? Yeah, that <laughs> conversation came up was like, I have this bag of your teeth. Oh, God. And Rachel was like, that's kind of weird and gross. Do you want your Can teeth? we like not keep that anymore? Like, what are we going to pass down all of our teeth <laughs> through generations? Like, what's the plan here? Oh, no. So we had to like, yeah, have that conversation. And Just then throw away a bag of teeth. Yeah. But like our kids were, you know. I mean, this was this was like six months ago. Yeah. Well, no, what did I say? Five years ago. I don't know. It, this conversation has come up multiple times because our kids are still losing teeth. So it's kind of like, what do we do with these teeth? And our kids are like, yeah, that's weird. We don't want you to keep our teeth. And we're like, yeah, that is kind of weird and yeah. gross. We're just not going to do that. So yeah. we just don't keep our kids' teeth. Yeah. Yeah. Right. We, uh, Trash. Anyway. Yep. Anyway. Cool. Well, that's it for me. Cool. Um, you got to give everybody a bridge update. We 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 had a there we is had, a bridge update. We had somebody write in about it. Can't wait to see Brian's bridge. I do have a bridge update. The bridge is done. I got it all done. You happy with it? I'm very happy with it. Nice. It's a very solid bridge. The weather wasn't the best, so I had to do a lot of work kind of off and on. It was wet this weekend. Dodge the rain and stuff like that. But it was like, if it's just a light drizzle, like I can can deal with that. Yeah, it wasn't super bad, but it was still Um, wet. Yeah. So, I mean, I had to basically, you know, what was previously a culvert pipe with dirt over top of it the pipe collapsed and the dirt also collapsed so i was like well that's not great because i think there's just like you know it's just a it's just a little runoff creek running through this you know the woods basically and it's just there's no solid ground there it's just kind of like muddy so i was like if i do another culvert pipe like it's probably just going to sink into the mud again so what am i going to like put all this stuff down and try and like make it more solid underneath and i was like screw it this is forget the culvert pipe so i just abandoned that um, went the bridge route. So I got all the wood a couple of weeks ago. Um, and yeah, I went relatively simple, just two by 10 like beams, but I've doubled them up. So I, and I reversed the grain too, so that like, they'd be like super strong. So I nailed all those together. Wait, so like two by 10 beams going laterally? The length of it. Yeah. It's a sh- fairly short bridge. It's a 10 foot long bridge. So it's just, it's, it's bridging like a two foot Creek. Oh, okay. Like it's not that far of a okay, distance so I'm trying to cover. So it's mostly supported by earth. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's completely supported by earth. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, it's literally just, I just need to be able to get across this creek that is like narrower than this table here, gotcha. you know? So it's not that big of an area to cross, but it's like maybe three feet off the ground, mm-hmm. like three feet above the, the creek, well, that's all. you know, water. So, um, yeah, I just, you know, shored up. I, I took away some of the, the ground there and it's like all gravel underneath there. The ground's pretty solid. Mm-hmm. And I put down like the solid cinder blocks, not the not the ones with the holes in them, but just like solid cement, you know, so they're super solid, like yeah. you have for like a footing or something. Like kind of like pavers? <clears throat> yeah, but they're like three inches thick, like oh, they're really, okay. really thick cinder gotcha. blocks. Okay. Um, but it's, they're, they're totally solid. So it's just that to even just firm it up even more. And then I did the two by tens on those, did a bunch of blocking to connect all the two by tens together. And then... So I did that like every 12 inches. So I like doubled up two by tens every 12 inches. Really, really strong. Oh yeah. And then um, I did two by sixes across. Oh, wow. Yeah. So. Oh. It's very hardy. You know what? Well, I don't know what I expected. Well, I want to be able to drive the tractor across. Yeah. Which if I have the tractor with like a back, I've got a backhoe attachment. If I had that on the back and I've got, I mean, literally the first time I drove across it, I was moving the gravel that I needed to build up the other yeah. side of so you it. Need something like, that so you can get a thousand pounds of gravel with twice this, the weight. Yeah. You need something that can hold a lot of weight. And so that's So with all that stuff under it, doesn't it raise up the bridge? It did. Yeah. So do you, do you now have to like do a little rampy thing mm-hmm. on each side? Yeah, I had to compact down some gravel cuz I mean I tried to like dig as much as I could, mm-hmm. but it's like a sloped area that I'm going in, so like on the the higher side, I was able to kind of dig in a little bit, so it wasn't quite as drastic. But on the far side, I just there was nowhere to dig 
because then I was hitting the logs and stuff that I did to make that like bed across the yeah. mu- mucky muck area there. So it's like, well, I, you know, that's the only solid land that I had there. So I just had to build it up. And so now I have like basically like coming off of the bridge, I have like gravel that's compacted that I had to kind of slope down. So, you know, I had the gravel. I had, I have a plate compactor. Which was the gravel in buckets? I used the bucket of the tractor. Yeah. So uh. a very large bucket. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, I probably used, I don't know, 10 tons of gravel in the whole project. You just had 10 like tons that. of gravel laying around. I did. Yeah. Cause I, no, not 10 tons. That's a lot. Cause I've get, whenever I get gravel, because I had to do like, this was like a couple of years ago, but I had to do like the edging along my driveway. Yeah. So the asphalt doesn't I used, crumble. I used something like 60 tons of gravel when I had to do that. It's just, Jeez. this is why I have a tractor because it's just like, there's so much land to maintain. Oh like yeah. I have to do this stuff. And the amount that you would um, pay to some, to have someone do that is obscene. Oh, I've already paid for the tractor. Yeah. Like by just by that project. 100%. Probably. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I, when I get a truckload of gravel delivered, um, they bring basically like one of those, it's like an 18 wheeler sized like Mac, tr- like a, uh, like dump truck. It's like, you know, got the, I forget how many wheels are on the thing, but it's, it's a very big dump truck. Which is another reason you need to make sure your driveway doesn't fall apart. Yes. Well, that's why my driveway was falling apart because <laughs> when COVID first started and the driveway edging was like, you know, had like, you know, compre- compacted or whatever over time. Yeah. All the like delivery trucks and stuff that were coming through all the time because we couldn't go anywhere. They were all driving off the edge of my driveway and crumbling all the edges yeah. of my driveway. So I had to build all that up and it just became a whole thing. Um, so yay, home ownership. Um, but it's okay. I like doing stuff. So you need, you, know. you need to establish a uh, construction route. Into, I know. into like the back, the, in, <laughs> in, into the behind your house. I need a, a service road yes, on that's, my property. Yes, that's what I meant to say. Service road. Yeah. Yes. Unfortunately, like our land, there's only there's only like one entrance. Like I have a neighbor in front of me. Yeah. So like our driveway, it's like that's the only access. So oh, it man. is basically the service road. Yeah. But I mean, it works out. So I just get every you know, I just I know I'm going to use gravel eventually. It just sits there in a pile. So yeah. you know, I just get I think it's 18 tons of gravel that I get delivered at a time. Each one of those truckloads is 18 tons. I will say so, more often than not, when when I have seen collections of yours, be it you know, things you've told me about, you know, as far as projects, construction goes, or just a bunch of pens, your, your, your hoarding is not insanity. It is, it, it is. There's generally a method to the madness. It is often justified. No, absolutely. It is, it give is you madness, that. Yeah. but there is a method to it. Yeah. Justifiable so. madness. Yeah. But hey, you know, a project like this, it's like I had the gravel on hand, didn't have to go and go. coordinate that on top of everything else. So that was nice. Um, but now I need more gravel. So I'm probably going to have to get another load because like I, I don't have any reserve gravel now. And it's been a couple of years since I laid all the other gravel. So there's like some touch up spots. I How many to propane do. tanks do you keep on hand? I currently have three 25 pound propane tanks. And that's not just for your grill, though. You use it. You use it for other stuff. It's mostly for the grill. One of them I was gifted because okay. my sister got rid of her grill, and yeah. she was like, "I don't need this tank anymore." Okay. So I have, I have more propane tanks than I intended. Are to they have. mostly full? Uh, they're mostly full right now. Oh, impressive. Yeah. I'll use it for the grill, and I'll use it for the uh, weed burner, that like blowtorch thing. Yeah, that's what I'll, I'll use it for. That's cool. about it. Yeah, I try. I to don't keep, use a ton of propane. I try yeah. to. I try to keep one on hand, but it's empty right now. And yeah, yeah. But we don't grill as much in the winter, so true. Yeah. I like having two tanks because I again I never like check it so I usually run out in the middle of grilling something. I have a I have a like, I have yeah, a um a little gauge or whatever. Yeah, yeah. I, I but wanna, not like hyper accurate. You know? No, so it's like you kind of stay on top of it a little yeah. bit. But I just I got so much going on in my life. I just I'm like I'd rather just like have the extra tank. Yeah, but now I have two extra tanks. Maybe you can have it. I don't know. No, nah, I, mean, I don't have room. <laughs> I have that one little attached shed and yeah, barely fit it. But it's good. For, it's good for you know. It's good for me because I don't keep too much stuff like that's why i can't do a project that requires a wheelbarrow because i would have no place Mm. to put said wheelbarrow i keep my wheelbarrow outside like i have a collapsible leaf you know bucket you know so everything needs to be tight and organized so yeah i have i have a lot of sheds and i have a lot of things to store outside of the sheds as well i mean i could put a shed in the backyard but i don't want to i like fair enough i like i like being regulated by space yeah uh I live in the country and we have some land and I have a tractor with a pallet forks on it. So I have a lot of stuff stored on pallets. It's a little, it's a little podunk, you know, no, it's I definitely, don't think so. Yeah. It's, I've, it's, I've got like, 
I'm from I'm, multiple trailers. Brian, I've got you know. I'm, I don't have any. I don't have any disabled vehicles stored on my property. Yeah, I'm from. I was raised in <laughs> Hanover. You, yeah. I I know what. Yeah. Your, what it's your your times. situation is times. not bad. Yeah. I've fine. I've seen bad. It's it's all understandable. You're like, yeah, okay. I know why people store stuff. No, your like, yours is organized. <laughs> it is intentional. Mostly. Like. Mostly, no, yeah, there's you're a, you're fine. There's you're a method just, to it. You're just fine. There's a method to it. But yeah, so I mean, I ended up doing that. I mean, obviously, I'll like have pictures and stuff. I don't, you know, whatever. Yeah. You'll see them. I'll but, see um, I mean, it's there's no like railings or anything to worry about. It's literally just I needed a crossing, so I was just building a floor pretty much, and yeah, it's solid. So I feel really good about that. And I got all the gravel compacting stuff done. Of course, in the middle of trying to compact the thing, the the pull cord on my plate compact. This is the least relatable thing in the world, but the plate compactor that I have for these various projects, um, it basically just, it's a giant machine that just shakes. That's all it does. Is it one of those like jackhammer tamper things? Yeah. Okay. Just, yeah. But I've seen people ride those. Um, so you can get ones that are more like jackhammer shaped. Yeah. Mine's not like that. Mine's oh. like on the ground. It's oh. more like a lawnmower. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it's kind of like a push gotcha. mower, okay. but it's just like a hundred pound machine that just shakes like heck. Mm -hmm. So it's, kind of fun to use but also it's you know your pull cord broke yeah so, so I, when the, first the, time i went to start does it get the, sucked into the thing like well it's like it like has a little spring and it kind of coils up there but yeah i went to pull it and it just ripped off and i was uh -huh. like okay kind of need that for this project why haven't they figured out how so, to make <laughs> cords that don't rip like they like well they do but they're more expensive I didn't buy like the nicest machine it's a you cord. could. Like, come on. Well, I just replaced it. I've had it. lawnmowers that did that. I'm like, well, I haven't, how have y'all not figured this out? Yeah. It's been figured out. You just got to pay. I Get admit the lawnmower that cord. this happened to was a hand me down. So, yeah. yeah. But I mean, plus, like, especially if you, I mean, that thing, I leave it outside. I don't, you know, I don't, whatever. Nah. It's, it's, covered it's in my tractor like carport thing yeah. so it's like it's covered sort of but it's definitely exposed to the elements um anyway so i had to replace that and that was fun so i come in and i do these things and i tell rachel like what i've been up to like this was on saturday and i'm like i was doing this and then i had to remember the pull cord and she's just like okay like she's trying the to be pull cord on your what yeah she's i'm like don't worry about it just tell me yeah but she, i will say I mentioned to Rachel, like, you know, I, I do a lot of work outside and most of the time she's like, has no idea what's going on any more than you all do. Um, but lately she's been like coming out more and just kind of like watching, seeing what's going on. So as I'm like sweating it out, running into problems and having to do stuff, she can just like appreciate it that much more. That's awesome. Like how much manual labor it is actually yeah. out there. So when I come in, I'm all tired and gross. She's like, I get this it. This is why. I get it. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that's fun. So now I have my bridge over troubled water. It's all good. Um, also, I helped a friend build a bunk bed for his kids. So that was kind of fun. Oh, fun. So he was like, you know, he's got four kids and he's like, yeah, we can't like spend a lot of money on these bunk beds. And I was like, all right, man, let's do it. So when just got like two by fours, two by six, it's just construction lumber. It's like, it's not going to be the, you know, fanciest thing, but it's going to be cheap. And it's going to be sturdy. So got to help him do that, you know, because I've got a woodworking shop and all that kind of stuff. So that was pretty fun. Um, I don't have anything to show because it's like not my bed. So I feel weird like showing somebody else's project, but did that. Um, also watched a couple of movies with the kids because we've got like a list of movies. It's so funny because like Rachel and Joseph are so similar. Rachel's not really that into movies. And like, we always propose these things and it's like, oh, we could, you know, it's like, whatever, we'll finish dinner. It'll be like 6.30 and we're like, oh, we could watch a movie tonight and whatever. And Joseph's always like, eh. he never is in the mood to like watch a movie. He just like always has other things he wants to do. So it got to the point where it's like, all right, well, we're watching a movie. If you want to participate, sure. Or if you just want to like, whatever, play Switch or something while we are watching a movie. This is, this is what we're doing. Mm. Yeah. No, but, I cannot do that. It's like, you were either, we're either watching a movie or we're not. Uh, we're mm -hmm. a lot more casual about it. But anyway, um, so we watched The Emperor's New Groove, oh. which I had never seen. Oh, really? I'd never seen it. But we just missed it. It was like, when did that movie come out? Like 2008 or something like oh, that? Oh, no, it was 2006? Before. It was before then. No, it was like, you know, probably like 2003. Was it 2003? Uh, nearer there. Let's find out. Because they, they, had, they had Treasure Planet and Atlantis back to back in like 2001, 2002. 2000, 2000. Okay, so it was right around that time. Okay. Yeah. There you go. Uh, my wife loves that movie. She has... So yeah, we would have been like 16 when that movie came yeah. out. 
It was I, just like a dry spell of Disney at that time. I wasn't paying attention to anything Disney at 16 yeah, years old. No. Um, my wife has a uh, Emperor's New Groove purse that she carries around. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. She loves it. It's good. It's one it of her good. favorites. Yeah. It, was a, it's a, it was a sleeper. Yeah. Yeah. It's solid. I mean, everybody probably knows this. I'm like very, very late to the party on this one. 24 years late to the party, in fact. But we watched it with the kids. They loved it. Kronk is hilarious, of course. Yeah, it's a good one. Um, so yeah, Kronk's New Groove is going to be on our watch list here pretty soon. Um, and then we watched Mean Girls, which was a very different style of movie. Mm-hmm. Um, but our kids are getting to that like teenage years. And it's like, there's definitely like some cursing and some like adult themes in that movie, obviously. But our kids are at the age now where I'm like, they're definitely hearing about all this stuff at school. So like, yeah. I need to be active in their life and just be able to explain things and all that kind of stuff. But I was, I was starting to ruin the movie because it was Joseph had no interest in watching it, but Ellie did, and you know, trying to explain like the dynamics of school relationships and all these types of things, and I was like. Okay, Ellie, no, d- don't don't think that this is how it actually works. And I was, and I was like, I was way dadding the thing. And I was like, right, I'm just going to ruin the movie. We'll just, we'll talk afterwards. But it was pretty entertaining. And Do they know that there's a musical coming out? Oh, yeah, they know. They know. Yep. Um, but she had watched like High School Musical and stuff like that. So she, I think she kind of gets that like, that's not really how things work, you know? So I trust her on that. But um, yeah, Mean Girls, definitely some t- things that like, haven't aged quite so great uh, in that, but it still holds up pretty well. I gotta say, we saw the pretty musical movie uh, on stage, um, and that was fantastic. So now they're making the musical movie. Mm. Um, so right, adapt the, the movie based on the musical based on the movie. That's what they did with High School Musical too, because they did no, they did a they did three movies. They did a Broadway play, and then they did a mo- no, they did a TV show. I might be getting this wrong. A TV show based on the Broadway play, which was based on the movies. Oh, wow. I think that's how it works. Anyway. We watched confusing. Moana. Uh, Archer wanted to watch a movie with the family. Oh, yeah. So we just sat down it's and watched Moana. Um, and uh, it was the first time we got the opportunity to stream it in 4K. And it got okay. to look gorgeous. The yeah. water in that movie yeah. is outstanding. That's a good one. I thought of you, too, because I saw an interview with Stephen Colbert and Christopher Nolan, the okay. director. Yeah. Famed director Christopher yeah, Nolan. I love his stuff. Yeah. Do you know what franchise christopher nolan is a big fan of i have no idea fast and furious loves it he was telling stephen colbert stephen colbert was just like i I haven't seen any of those and nolan was like let me tell you like they're like in that genre they are the best and he was like well what order should i watch them and he's like all right he he had answers like he was yeah he's a fan fan he's a fan christopher nolan how about that there you go i would love to see a christopher nolan fast and furious (laughs) movie that would be, I, I think I could, I just, I would be done. I'd be yeah. just like, I don't need to watch any more movies. Yeah. It won't get any better than that. Yeah. <laughs> so there you go. Don't let anybody Very tell cool. you. Don't, okay. let, don't let everybody tell you that uh, Fast and Furious is a classless franchise. People can say that all they want, but I'm not going to listen to there it. There you go. Because I know, you've got, I know you, what's up. You've got it on good authority. I still haven't seen the latest one, though. The one with John oh, Cena. Oh, my. I'm behind. Yeah. I, we've missed like the last two or three Bond yeah, movies. It's well. there when you need it. I know. It's just, there's so much else going on. Um... Let's see here. We played a new. We got a. Um, we got a card game called Phase Ten. Yeah, I've heard of that. Yeah, we got it for Christmas two Christmases ago. Hadn't played it yet, so we finally played it. Uh, it was pretty fun. Yeah, kids really enjoyed it. Yeah, Ellie won, of course. She freaking wins everything, but she legitimately won. Um, been playing a lot of tenor sax. There we go. Keeping up with that. So I kind of made it. I you know my heart is really like I want to play the berry sax but it's expensive and it's hard to justify. So I kind of made a deal with Rachel that, you know, I've like looked at them of course before um, and I have my eye on one, but it's going to take a bit to, you know, justify. And it's like, you know, as serial hobbyists, sometimes it's helpful to put a little bit of space in between your pursuits so that you can see like, am I really going to still be as into this? you know, after the honeymoon phase is over. That is a way of life for me. Yep. So I did that. So I talked to her and I was like, all right, what would be like a a realistic, like if I've put in so much time 
you know, then I'm pretty serious about it. And, you know, I could justify, you know, getting more into the saxophone thing. Cause essentially that's what I'd be doing. Cause I, I would still keep the tenor, but I would be adding a berry. Um, and so she, she was like, yeah, like a hundred hours of practice seems like a pretty decent amount. Cause I was like, I'm practicing, you know, four or five days a week, you know, 30, 45 minutes per time. That seems like a pretty decent commitment. Uh, to keep up with. So that's what I'm doing now. I've got a spreadsheet where I'm keeping track of my practice time as I do. And uh, I started tracking that on January 31st. And I, I was practicing before that, but it was like, as of when we had that conversation, it was like, all right, a hundred hours from there. Um, so I've already practiced like 12 and a half hours. That's or respectable. Like that. So yeah, in two weeks. So it's like, I'm, I'm doing it. You'll get there. My lip is a little sore because like, when you play a reed instrument, you tend to, your bottom teeth will like cut into the soft oh. part of your lower lip. And it's like, I might be, I might be practicing a bit much uh. these days. Cause I've gone like over a week now without taking a break. Like I'm playing every day and I'm Ooh. like, cause I, you know, I, you know, what gets measured gets sure. done. So like, as I've been measuring my practice time more, I'm like more motivated to do oh, it. Oh like, boy. I might have to, I might have to take it a little easy. But that's okay. It's a it's an okay problem to have. I'll I'll, I'll temper it. Um, yeah, and then just like doing lots of development interviews and stuff like that. That's going to be a lot of my life for the next two weeks. So that might naturally help temper the <laughs> the sax practicing time. Um, and then this, I just thought of this. I haven't seriously thought about this, but um, there's a game on the Steam Deck because I was I mentioned like you know considering getting an Xbox or something like that, and I'm like I just don't. I just know that I wouldn't use it enough to justify it. Um, so I was trying to look on the steam deck, like, well, where do you have a steam deck? What games are there? But there's n n very few of like the mainstream games that like, hold really on, run so well on the steam deck. I've got an idea of what you're going to say, but you go ahead and say it. What? No, what are you, you going to say? There's a game called power wash simulator. <laughs> no, that's pretty funny. No. I have seen that. Okay. I might, I don't know. I might try that. <laughs> that was what I thought you were going. I power washed a lot of things in my I life. Know. That's how I paid my way through school and my dad and I had a power washing business. Um, he did that for like 17 years. Yeah. Then. Um, it's surprisingly popular. Like the whole power I know, washing thing. I know. Okay. So you were going to say a different game? I'll have to look at that. I haven't seriously looked at, at that, but no, there's a, there's, there's a couple different games. There's one called snow runners. I think it's called, or another one might be like mud runners. So it's literally like, have you ever seen like the Microsoft flight simulators? Yeah. You know, it's not like a, pew, I'm flying through, no, you know. Simulation. It's, it's very a, yeah, simulation. Very realistic simulation. Very like, realistic simulation. So they basically. People buy whole rigs for those games. Yeah. So they basically, it's kind of like that, but for like. Construction like, equipment? No, it's like hauling like off-road vehicles. So you're like driving through the mud. Oh, wow. So you'll have to like get a load of logs from one place to another. And it's like. But it's like you're driving in real time and you have to like switch your differential and you have to, you know, put the chains on your tires to oh get through the mud and all that. And I was like, I kind of want that. Like, you know, because it's like, you know, you're kind of like doing work work on easy mode. That's amazing. You know, because like Rachel will do her little Animal Crossing and she'll yeah. be like, oh, I need to build a shed. Boop, boop, bop, bop. You know, it right. just like happens. And I'm like, yeah, it's a lot more complicated than that. <laughs> you know, I'll be like working on like building our deck for like four weeks and she's just like, boop, 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 boop. I, Look, I, built, a a I built a deck today too, Brian. Yeah, and I'm just like, mm, okay. <laughs> but I don't know. It's like, it seems kind of appealing, but I'm also like, I don't I, know. I, do you I want totally to should. Be, yes, you do. Would be, I think it would be kind of fun. I'm sure it's like, what, 30 bucks, something like that? If that, probably. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. yeah. Just get know. it and it'll be there when you need it, just in case. Yeah. I was yeah. like, yeah, they literally designed this game for people like me. Please get it's that like, game. I really want to hear <laughs> you talk you're about literally playing like that game. Driving a muddy truck from like one destination I to another it. in real time. Like you're driving, it's like 10 miles an hour trucking through the mud. Please. And that's it. There's nothing else. There's you no crazy to, music. Need... There's no enemies trying to attack you. Those you're game developers deserve yeah. your purchase they, because yeah. you are who they made it for. Yeah. You need to just a couple different versions oh, of it. Yeah. award them your money by saying, yes, yeah. I'm here for you. We'll see. We'll see. It seems appealing. Definitely. I'll get through development reviews. We'll okay, we'll that could be there. your prize. Yeah, that could be my prize. <laughs> I get to have a, a mud running video game simulator. Oh. Anyway, oh, that's fun. Anyway, so that's where I'm at right now, right now in my life. Fantastic. Having fun, you know, doing things. Um, okay, we'll go ahead and wrap this up. We don't have any company updates because we already did them. Hey. So I guess we can go right into the wrap up. Well, I want to thank you all for watching. Please leave us some feedback. Let us know how we're doing. Ask us questions so we can keep the show going. Um, check your lay pens for fountain pen, ink, and paper needs. 
like and subscribe, YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, all the things. So I have a fun fact, Drew. You told me I'm going to like this fun fact. So I do think you're going to like been it. Thinking I know you like the else. subject of the fun fact for sure. Okay. So is it nerdy? Um, not no? particularly. Oh, okay then. Well. Um, but I know that you are a fan of the McDonald's fillet of fish. You know why? I, <laughs> that is the subject. Of you know today's why? I love the fillet of fish, facts. Brian. I've yeah. told you this before. It looks like the picture in the menu. Name one other thing. Maybe the Chick-fil-A sandwich. That's pretty accurate. Usually more flat than advertised. Mm -hmm. The filet fish usually exactly as advertised. The bun is smooth, soft, great on the face, and looks exactly like the picture. Sometimes the patty and the cheese, a little cattywampus. Usually no. Usually the filet fish Depends who's making it. is advertised. Yeah. You're, I yeah. appreciate the transparency of the filet fish It's honest. It's up front. It's there when you need it. Well, and not overly unhealthy compared to other fast food stuff. I was thinking about it because I I'd heard that the filet of fish came about because of Lent. I've heard that as well. And I looked it up and I went to McDonald's official corporate website and hey. got the story. So All I'm right, gonna share the story Give us of the, the fish scoop. history of the filet of fish. Um, so according to corporate.mcdonald's.com slash corp mcd slash our stories slash article slash filet of fish journey dot html slash creed thoughts <laughs> that's right uh the filet of fish has a storied past dating back to 1962 with franchisee lou i don't know how to pronounce his name g-r-o-e-n oh um green i don't I was know. Like green Gro i was like groin no i don't uh, think it's groin 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 lou from Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, his restaurant was located in a predominantly Roman Catholic neighborhood, and he noticed a decrease in sales on Fridays. With determination and a knack for thoroughness, he convinced McDonald's to test a breaded whitefish sandwich to help satisfy customers who abstained from eating meat on Fridays in observance of Lent. At first, McDonald's executives were not certain about adding fish to the menu, which required a more complicated cooking process. As a matter of fact, McDonald's founder Ray Kroc had plans for what he called the Hula Burger, a slice of grilled pineapple and cheese on a bun. I've that sounds of, disgusting. I've heard of the Hula Burger. Yes. Kroc made a deal with, I'll call him Green, with Green, that they would sell the Hula Burger and the filet of fish on a Friday, and whichever sandwich sold the most would be added to the permanent menu. Kroc was so convinced that his Hula Burger would outsell the filet of fish that he made a side bet with his first grillman, Fred Turner, that the loser would buy the winner a new suit. What a 60s thing to do, yeah. huh? The final score, the Hula Burger, six. filet fish 350 Whoa! Wipe the floor. Wipe the floor. Nice. In 1965, the filet fish was the first addition to McDonald's original menu. It was the only non-hamburger option and sold for 29 cents. Last year, 25% of all filet of fish sandwiches were sold during the Lenten season. That's a lot of friggin' fish. Uh, it's served many other countries, including Russia, Japan, and India. And you can get it with a spicy twist in Asia with wasabi. And it's offered in select U.S. restaurants with a specially formulated Old Bay tartar sauce. So there you go, some little filet of fish. I want there. a wasabi filet of fish. Got to go to Asia. Oh, oh. man. There you go. All right, Japan, here I come. Fun facts. Fun facts about the filet of fish. That is so, awesome. And some, some, that. sometimes I've benefited from Lent, you know, not being a practitioner, but mm. uh, after Lent, sometimes they have an overabundance of fish patties and they'll sell a two for Ooh. one or even a double filet of fish sandwich, which Ooh. I have partaken in. Oh, that sounds pretty good. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I mean, Fat Tuesday, there you go. That's a, that's a, a byproduct as well. Not I mean, the McDonald's side of things. but I don't know what Fat Tuesday the, is. Fat Tuesday is the celebration of the Tuesday before Ash Wednesday, the start of Lent. So it exists because oh, of Lent. I yeah. thought it was just like a New Orleans party thing. I mean, you're partying because you're going to not be partying during Lent. Oh. That's what it's all about. So Lent is Why a is it focused in New abstinence. Orleans? Why is it so understood to be a New Orleans There's thing? There's a big like French Creole population, you know. And those are predominantly Catholic? Yeah, Frank, oh. French Catholic yeah, is a big thing. Oh. So I don't know all the details of it. I'm sure it's more, much more nuanced than that. Way more than I do. I have a French background, so. You know, oh. It's, why I know well, look at this. That, it, the, the, that fun fact was packed full of yeah. info nuggets. That's right. So yeah, tomorrow, well, tomorrow in real time, because we're recording this on Tuesday, we'll be- Have Wednesday. you ever had a filet of fish sandwich? I've had a filet of not in a long time, but maybe I will. Maybe I'll take it there in Lent this year. There we go. Know. Contribute to the 25% There increase. we go. There you go. So you totally should. Maybe I will. 
and just just appreciate that bun. Appreciate how beautiful it is and how much it looks like the picture. And and, and if you want to lay it on your face like yeah, a pillow. Yeah, yeah, just a little bit. Just a little bit. <laughs> I don't know what kind of chemicals you're getting on your face when you do that. But. Good ones. I guess it can't be good for your skin. <laughs> Whatever kind of butter there substitute are worse they have things on to there. put on your face than a filet fish bun, Brian. I, you might be the first person to have ever said those words in a sentence. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's our fun fact for today. Hope you enjoyed this one enough to last you two weeks at least. But we'll be back later on with more stories to tell. I'm sure. Oh, you'll have Disney stories. That'll be fun. Oh yeah. Yeah, it'll be a good time. Anyway, thanks so much for watching and right on. <laughs>